I thought I tried. There. Okay. It is about 7.01 on Thursday, October 1st in the year 2020. So I will call to order the plan commission meeting for this evening. Amy, if you would please do a roll call of our plan commission members to establish a quorum. Hugh Vettel. Here. Derek Daniel. Here. Mary Ellen Ramsack. Here. Mary Salisbury. Here. Linda Waite. Here. Terry Riker. Here. Jay Hubner. Here. All right, so we have all seven of our plan commission members present. And if Amy, our clerk, would confirm that the uh, agenda has been properly noticed. The agenda has been properly noticed. And then I would look for a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Mary Ellen. I'll second. second. Second by Laird. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Public participation. Um, if you wish to address, I guess, the short-term rental, our old business continuation there under A, um, we could probably do it then, unless you want to address the members now, that would be fine too. I would like to speak, but it's up to you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Be my guest. Just state your name and address for the record, please, Jim. My name is James Mitchie. I reside at 4159 Bayshore Drive in Sevastopol. I am speaking in support of the proposed short-term rental ordinance as written. I do not rent short-term property, nor do I live anywhere within 200 feet of such a short-term rental. So I have no dog in this fight, really. Uh, but I do have experience uh, in short-term rentals. I am a frequent user of both VRBO and Airbnb and have rented several dozen places in the U.S. and overseas with stays ranging from 2 to 30 days. Perhaps more importantly, for 10 years, my wife and I owned and rented a North Carolina beach house that we rented by the week and sometimes for three days. It was managed by a local real estate company there. I certainly learned a lot about economic and human behavior uh, from that experience. Uh, I feel that the proposal ordinance will do much to address the current problems with short-term rentals. I uh, had an opportunity to look at this update uh, briefly, and it's striking that uh, half of the Short-term rentals are not state licensed, and if I read this correctly, and that half uh, are, have their septic system overloaded. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, it lists uh, that there's 66 short-term rentals. Is that a count from VRBO or Airbnb or similar listings, or is that just from uh, Door County data? Door County terms. Thank you. Uh, I think there's many more than that if you look online. Uh, I find that it's my opinion that this protects the, le the legitimate and well-managed existing property owners, the motels, the bed and breakfasts, and other established owners, by requiring that all have inspections, requirements, and management that one would expect when coming to Door County and to the state of Wisconsin. Right now, there's an uneven playing field between the serious and the ad hoc properties, and it would bother me if I had rental property, which I don't. I think it safeguards the renters, who should expect properly run, clean, and adequate places when they show up and stay. It gives neighbors a means to address out-of-control occupancy, bad behavior, and parking problems when and if needed. The main objection I can envision is the six-day minimum stay requirement. Uh, I realize that this may limit some of the rental market, but feel this is an important requirement. I'd like to explain why. In our North Carolina experience, the great majority of property when we had property damage or theft occurred when we rented for three days rather than the usual one week. I thought about this a lot, and we observed that week-long renters are more interested in settling in and enjoying the area and what the area has to offer 
and the three-day weekenders are often there just to party. Week-long renters are more committed to the stay and enjoyment of the area as a whole, which I think is something we want in Door County. Also, in our renting experience, we found that when you add in cleaning and other fees, uh, hotels are often cheaper than three-day rentals. Plus, the uh, hassle and uncertainty of check-in and check-out is much more dependable and simple. Uh, just one final note, I think uh, may not be, need to be in the ordinance, but somehow grandfathering needs to be handled uh, should this uh, ordinance be put in place. In fact, we had an incident where two weeks before we were going to check into an Airbnb, it got canceled because an ordinance was put in place in that location that uh, uh, negated our reservation. So we were kind of held high and dry. Thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Do any of the planning commission members have any questions for Jim at this time? You? Yeah, I just have a clarification relative to the data on the septic that we provided. It was estimated based on tank size, okay. and the only way that we can confirm that is actually pulling the actual records that are on file at the town. I think I should have in my presentation I gave one example. Okay. Um, you know, we're going to pull other ones once Amy frees up for her election. I understand right that. Uh, so. <clears throat> so that builder just estimates. Anyone else? All right. Sir, would you please state your name and address? Sure. My name is Jim Decane. This is my wife, Amy. We're from Watsonburg, a little way south here. Uh, we own the property at 3946 Bayshore Drive, as well as 5066 Bayshore Drive. In uh, 2012, I purchased the land there. Uh, I got my permits through Linda here. And went every, took every step to follow the Door County zoning regulations that the town of Sebastopol provided me with. I built the home for a vacation rental. Followed all the rules. My home is currently listed with Door County Property Management and I have an annual inspection. I am state certified. I have a, my septic system is uh, pumped out and cleaned out yearly and inspected as well. Um, and, and the systems that are in these homes are obviously sized by the Door County Sanitarium. And that is what gives you your occupancy, and that kind of tells you how many people you can have in there. Uh, so we've been renting our homes since 2013. We have a lot of families, uh, couples, contractors, fishermen. We have not had one single problem. Our neighbors are really great because they have their families that come from out of town and stay in our home. So it's all been working great. The people that are using our vacation rentals, when they get here, they go to the gas station, they go to the grocery store, they stock up on all their stuff, especially this year with COVID, people wanted to be isolated, they took their families and they spent time together. And it's been really great. I've made some really good friends over just the last few years. And it does have a good, uh, positive impact on the economy. I mean, there's a lot of money getting spent by these people. Um, in regards to what we were talking about before with duration, duration is a very difficult thing to address because as we know what's going on in our world right now and having just got done raising our kids, the school activities, it's very hard for someone to say, I'll just take a seven day rental. They may end up paying for seven days and only if they use it one or two, but I don't know how that gets addressed. It's just very difficult to put duration on there. Um, and I just feel that any actions that you may take could negatively impact the amount of rental space available for families because as of right now, there is not enough. And I don't know how we address that. I can only, I, I can only do so much, but um, it should be in the plans moving forward to figure this out because there is more space that is needed. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments or questions of Mr. DeCain? Okay. Yeah, just clarification. What was the property that you uh, built? Was that the 5066? 
No, the 5066 was a, a lot, a two and a half acre lot with an abandoned cabin on. It was falling down. I purchased the land, I cleared it, I cleaned it all up. I haven't, I designed a home for it, but I haven't built it yet. So that's why I'm in the pretty big interest of this topic. I have a lot of money invested in this stuff already, so. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else at this um, time? Hi. Please state your name and address. Uh -huh. My name is Janet Ancone, and we own property here at 4890 South Cape Point Drive. A um, couple of things. I'm not opposed to the whole ordinance, but there are parts of it that I would ask you to rethink. Um, we do rent our house, and we've rented it since, um, let's say, for four, four summers now. Uh, my family has been at that spot since the late 1800s. My aunt and my grandmother rented cottages there through the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s. So I'm not, while I don't currently live up here, we currently live in South Carolina, I have a lot of ties to that particular piece of property. And like the gentleman before us, five of our 10 or 11 weeks that we rent are rented by our neighbors who have homes up there that are not big enough to include their families now with the children who got married and the grandchildren who got, you all know, know how that goes. But I would ask you to consider a couple of things. One, I think everybody ought to be licensed. We are, and I think everybody else ought to be. Um, and if that requires you hiring someone to see to that, then I'm not opposed to, to paying a, a fee for that, even an initial fee. But I do think that since the state requires $300, $500 is a little excessive. Um, the second thing I want to say is in the era of COVID, I'm staying at a house with my children as a renter because I don't want to be in a motel. I don't want to have to put on a mask every time I walk out of my door. I want to be able to go to the beach and enjoy it without having to deal with all of that and also without having to worry that myself or my children are going to get COVID. So that's an advantage of someone renting their house. And it's an advantage, particularly in this day and age, that I think a lot of people are looking for. So if I can't rent on the 4th of July weekend in Sebastopol, I'm going to go to Sister Bay or Fish Creek or Egg Harbor. And I think you're being a little bit naive if you think I'm going to go from Sister Bay down to the happy hour in Belmy for dinner. I, I, that's just not going to happen. I'm not going to go to the, the gas stations in Sebastopol. I'm going to go to the things up there. And I'm sure I'm not going to the grocery store because after all they just redid the Piggly Wiggly in Sister Bay so I would go up there. So it's not just us for the short term windows, but particularly for the 4th of July and the Labor Day weekend and perhaps somewhat for Memorial Day. I think there's going to be a loss of revenue to some of the businesses that are in Sebastopol. Um, so I would have you consider that as well in terms of the number of days that people are renting. Thank you. Any response to Ms. Anton? All right, anyone else? Mr. Estes? Mr. Estes, hey. Steve Estes. Uh, we have a uh, small rental in Sebastopol. I gotta take this down a little bit, guys. Um, but we, uh, we've we been doing the vacation rentals for probably three, four years now. We've got some other properties not in Sebastopol. Uh, we happen to have one um, on our current property and um, we worked very hard at it. Uh, going back to what we were talking about, I agree everything that you said. You said everything pretty, pretty good. Um, we're licensed. I think everybody should be licensed. I don't think that should be an issue. Um, I can tell you, living in Door County in a short season that we have, you've got to do a lot of things to try and make a living up here, especially for uh, if you want to own property. Um, Everything that we do for the rentals is based on ratings, based on you know, you're not going to get customers if you run a, a, a shabby place, let's just say that. So, I, um, Sorry. 
It's my daughter and I don't know how to shut it up. <laughs> Anyways, point being is, you know, we, ours is a very small in Sevastopol. I mean, we have a very small apartment that we rent out. But it does make a major difference. It helps us pay our taxes. It helps us keep upkeep on our place. Um, we, as you would talk, Mr. Duque, we've made a lot of friends since we've been doing it. Um, I, uh, we live on the property, so we can monitor it pretty easily. Um, as far as septic, uh, you know, septic uh, restrictions, um, we're in the septic business, so uh, believe me, uh, you guys need help, we'll help you out. But anyways, <laughs> um, point being, um, it is, uh, it's a much needed thing for a tourist area. I'll just say that. I don't know if you want to add anything to me or not, but. Um, Cammy Estes, Steve's wife, uh, 4604 and 4606 Bechtel Road. Um, we have had no problem with renters. We've all, we also have a place in Sturgeon Bay that we've rented for years. We do a lot of short term, two night, three night. They are not partiers. We have had no experience having a bad renter in years of doing this. Um, this day and age, maybe if you're retired, you can take a six day vacation, but families, there is no way that we can take six days at a time to rent a place and to go somewhere. And that would extremely be detrimental to our rental properties. It, it's very rare that we have that kind of rental. Um, it's just not feasible, especially for Door County. People come up, it's so close that people do come up just for a couple days. Um, a week long stay is not we're not retired. We, we don't have a liberty of doing that, and neither do our guests. Um, as far as septics, if there is a problem with a septic, we're in the pumping business. The homeowner is responsible for that. It's not a county issue. The homeowner is responsible. We go, we do the inspections, we do the pumping. I'm required to turn in all my gallons of each property, so it's it's something that's already regulated, so I'm not sure where all that part of it is coming in. So yes, as this is written, I strongly disagree with, with many points on it. Okay. Thank you. I think when we get to that um, section of the ordinance, we'll probably have a, a very lengthy discussion on the six day minimum and how that might or might not work. So, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay. Um, and I agree. Your name, please, and address. I'm Tomjanovich, and I live at 4779 Forest Road. Um, my mother owns a property on Glidden Drive. And as a family unit, um, not being able to live there ourselves, or a vacation, we've been renting it, and we, um, have JR Rentals as our go-to people and they help us out extremely well and we license when we're directed to which is every year we do inspections every year um, we have maintenance things done every year we put on a new roof and I was counting up the days there's 60 days in the last four months that were um, not full weeks you know, that there be a three day and a two day or a two day and a six day or four day. And I agree with Tammy too, if people can't, there's so many people who say we love it here, we come back year after year, and they come for three or four days. Um, young families can't, for one, afford the prices for a rental like that. And we've always had super cleaning jobs from JR. They come in even if it's one day, they come in and they clean, change the linens, or the people bring their own linens. We haven't had any problems in all the years that we've been renting um, with, with theft, with um, any kind of damage. And also, if somebody comes in for four days, it gives us as owners to go in there and do some maintenance or to fix something that might not be working properly. So um, we would lose a lot of renters 
by doing a seven-day or full week or more rentals. My children, for one, you know, they get the, a family, right? But, you know, right now it's hard for them to come up for more than three days. Um, and I, I find that with, with a lot of people. So we've hardly had any, well, I didn't count the full weeks, but there isn't that many full weeks in that short period of time, the summertime people rent, where they do the full seven days. So I just, um, we haven't had any problem. And I think it would, it would make the people that, that want to come up for a few days not be able to afford it, either the time or the money, and I think that our, our listing would be a lot less. Any comments for Ms. Tom Yanovich? All right. Sir, please state your name and address. Hi, I'm Ron Handy, Wendy Carter. Uh, our place is at 5217 uh, Red Sunset Lake. Uh, I was here a couple meetings ago, and that's when I first heard of the six-day minimum, which concerned me greatly. So I went back and did some uh, uh, calculating myself. And I think at the time, <clears throat> I might have mentioned this, that uh, uh, we've had 45 reservations at our place this year. Uh, of those, only two of them were more than six or more days. So you can see that concerns me greatly that we're trying to put a minimum to this. Um, again, we're regulated, licensed. Uh, we got to go through all the uh, approvals and so forth, and, and we've done that. We purchased the home based on knowing, just as this gentleman did, uh, knowing what was required. And I thought at the time we fulfilled all that. <clears throat> um, you know, may I suggest that if, if that's a report, requirement that you folks deem necessary uh, because of problems that have been occurring in, at the rentals, uh, maybe we uh, add something in here that that would go into effect if there's multiple violations of your ordinance <coughs> and so forth. Uh, but to just <coughs> come out with a six-day minimum, I mean, I mean, we're out of business if that happens. So I just wanted to. Uh, yeah. I think that would go over all the cases. Yeah. 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 Yep. Like, like I said, we're going to be cashed out all out here when we get to that item in that section. Will you finish, sir? Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? I have one more question. Sure. Uh, I'm just curious, um, as far as the fees are concerned, if we are already paying taxes and we are already paying for inspections in a state licensing and all that goes in with this fire extinguishers, smoke alarms, batteries, carbon monoxide detectors, there's a lot of stuff to this. If we're already paying, what is the fee for? Because we're already following through with the Door County zoning regulations and the fees we already incurred. I'm just curious what would there need to be a fee at all for? If we, and someone else can chime in, um, if we enact this ordinance, it will require administration costs on our part, monitoring, enforcement. Our alcohol and um, our uh, restaurants and bars pay $400 every year. They don't get a discount for renewal. And again, that comes, uh, falls, covers our costs of administration, our clerks, our postings, publications, various items. So we feel the fee would be justified in this initial period. It's just a little bit confusing because we've already all paid all that multiple times. And this is like a global network here. And I've never, I've looked into this and I've never heard of anything like this. So now I understand if the township was some providing support or logistics for some parts of this, then I would understand that. But I don't know, you only need to make a list and then make sure that we're having our inspections done. Well, I think it entails a little bit more than that. Uh, Mr. Zell, if you want to chime in on that, yeah. you've done a lot of work. In some of our uh, research of other communities that have 
implemented this post Act 59. Um, a couple of them, um, the one that we've done more of our benchmarking because it kind of matches our our area. If you look at Walworth County and an unincorporated Walworth County, Walworth County includes uh, Delavan, Lake Delavan, Lake Geneva area. So Walworth County is big agricultural, but also big tourism. You think of Lake Geneva and and weekend tourists coming up from the Ridge Chicago area. So we looked at the, at theirs. They actually had an ordinance in place prior to Act 59, so they had to modify it to Act 59 because they were um, on a pace of actually restricting short-term rentals completely in the, in the, in the unincorporated towns uh, of, of Walworth County. So um, they implemented an ordinance and their minimum stay is, is seven days or six nights. Uh, they implemented that in 2018. Um, they have, uh, they started with a $900 a year license and it's now, after two years, down to 600. And the majority of their license fee uh, goes to enforcement. Um, you know, noise, garbage are the two uh, main ones. Uh, they do, and, and their fees are associated, they have a part-time retired sheriff's deputy that basically goes to properties. Uh, a lot of, they have a lot of challenges with people having more occupants than uh, what they had listed for. Uh, or um, properties that uh, didn't register with the town at all. So I think out of I think 137, there are there are 50 they found they found noncompliant through um, through that process. So enforcement is is probably the largest uh, area um, that we have to do. There is a lot of reluctance from neighbors um, because uh, neighbors don't want to call the cops if there's noise because the Door County cops are busy in the summer. Um, and so, you know, so there's a lot of people that, you know, are, are putting up with the noise, you know, putting up with the traffic, putting up with not being able to get out of their driveways, and, and it's at a point where um, a lot of municipalities are putting in um, ordinances, and their biggest cost item is enforcement during, during the period. So I think that's the, the challenge, especially in small towns, um, is, you know, how do you do enforcement how do you try to preserve you know, the, the neighborhoods as, as much as you can in these residential areas and do that in a cost-effective manner that tries to balance things out on both sides? So that's, that's kind of where that, where that came from. Um, there's uh, some more towns we became aware of in, in Wisconsin that are uh, also implementing ordinances that are small villages, Williams Bay, Village of Montana. We're trying to just benchmark some of their uh, cost information as well, just to see where their buckets of spend are, because you know we're not going to charge anything more than what it takes to try to enforce, uh, you know what's going, you know uh, uh, how to manage these within the town. Thank you, Miss Anne Clayton. Um, Shannon Hampton again, 4890 South Cat Point Drive. I just did some quick math, and so. What I hear you saying, it's going to cost the town $33,500 to monitor 67 houses. I'm sorry. That just doesn't seem to jive pretty well. Um, that seems like a full-time salary for someone. And I just can't see we're monitoring 67 houses, of which 53% are already um, permitted. That seems like an exceptional yes. amount of money. Yes. Now, the hundred dollars a year would, of course, be six thousand seven hundred, and I can see that. That would be a portion of somebody's salary. But you could go to all sixty-seven in one week, um, or contact their owners by email, or however you need to do that. And most of those are with a property management company, though not all. And and you could make one stop and hit thirty of them. So. Um, uh, that's why I have some questions about the amount of money that you're asking. And I understand what you're saying, but you kind of, it just seems like a, a tremendous amount of money for that. Um, second thing I, I would like to say is I'm sure you are aware that you do not have a list of all the people who rent. And I, I've been told that you have someone on your staff that 
you know, goes through the internet, looks at Airbnb and all that, but that's not everyone. I belong to a number of women's groups in the area, and we'll just be sitting around talking, and someone will say, oh, I rent my house. And I'll say, well, how do you rent your house? You know, do you advertise? Oh, no, no, our neighbor is down in Illinois, or our neighbor is here or there, or their friends. We'll come up sometime for a week, and I know some people who routinely rent their house for a pumpkin patch, which of course is not an issue this year, and they go out of town, and they rent to friends of theirs from Illinois. And, and there's no way you're ever going to capture all that, I don't believe. But just so that you're aware, and I'm guessing you are, that there's a good bit of that that goes on. The Burr County Tourism Zone would probably be um, interested in hearing that. Anyway, anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, on the other half of uh, my wife here. Um, I, uh, Your name? I, Your name, My please. name is Dan and Cone. And it's the same address, 4890 South Cape Point Drive. Uh, I come from a background where I come from a compliance background. I come from a audit background. And so a lot of our things are driven by things like mission and vision and purpose and goals. And so as you're looking at this, I'm, I'm just wondering about the data that you've collected that would somehow um, you know, justify your moving into a three-day kind of uh, uh, rental as opposed to um, you know, a six-day or whatever the issue might be. Okay. So my, my question is more of a question. Where is the data that supports why this is even originating? I understand fees. This, the gentleman here was talking about, he was talking about other townships and other ordinances. This is a unique uh, township, and it should be based on data that you have, and not necessarily what other people are doing and using benchmarks. This town should be establishing its own benchmarks. Having said that, you also need to have a way of monitoring what you're, what you're trying to um, monitor and review for compliance or whatever. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm a little bit uh, confused about, again, wh where's the motivation coming from that even begun this as an issue? Um, so I'm a little confused about that, and, I, and I'll grant you, I, I haven't read all the material my wife has, but I'm trying to understand a timeline as to when this issue arose and based on what data that you were able to present to, um, to the council or to the subcommittee to be able to move into a, into a direction of making it into an ordinance. Are you talking about the six-day minimum or the ordinance as a whole? Probably the ordinance as a okay. whole. Yeah. Right. I'll be happy to answer that. Yeah. Um, as part of the 2017-2019 biennial state budget, the lawmakers in law enacted new laws that protects the abilities of homeowners, such as yourselves, to rent out their homes on a short-term basis. So, and that law was passed in response to a growing number of homeowners, such as yourself, wanting to rent out their homes. But in doing that, um, renting homes in residential dwellings, in residential neighborhoods, for periods of less than 30 days, some things came up. So rather than regulating the behavior of your guests, and you know and the neighbors complaining when it comes to noise or parking or the number of guests local communities were allowed to put into place some rules and regulations on owners of those properties who are always ultimately responsible for everything so like i said local municipalities can put some rules and regulations in per in place so due to the popularity of these short-term rentals, especially in high tourist areas such as Door County, the Lake Geneva area, Bayfield County up near Ashland or wherever, the new laws really encourage local governments to do some regulating rather than banning the activity you know, altogether. We're not seeking to ban short-term rentals here. And yes, many of you and 
most of the 67 others are compliant, hopefully, on all of the issues that we have in this draft ordinance. But if we don't have an ordinance in place, how can we enforce something? We have no standing to correct those who are non-compliant or we're getting constant complaints about parties of noise or barking dogs or parking. So we need something on the books in order to enforce it and in order to have standards. Otherwise, it's kind of a free-for-all. So it was a compromise, um, like I said, back in 2017. I think at 3 o'clock in the morning, the Wisconsin Motel and Hotel Association, the realtors, they compromised. Okay, you can short-term rent your home in a residentially zoned neighborhood, but they're the ones that asked for the six-day minimum because the intent was to have more of a family-type rental that you would not have two, three different parties going in and out of that residence throughout the week. That is my understanding. I believe me, I've done a lot of research on this. So that is where the lawmakers actually came up with the six-day minimum. So hopefully that gives you a little background. Now, like I said, when we get to that section, we'll try to hash it out here and uh, hopefully come up with a solution that works for everybody. But like I said, our intent is not to ban you from short-term rental. We can't do that. But in residential neighborhoods, trying to find that happy medium between the renters and the neighbors that are there year-round or all summer or whatever. Okay? Fair enough? Well, my question is, again, can you uh, reference a specific number in terms of, is this kind of an isolated thing, or is it something that you could say um, without question that you have X amount of people that have complained about the following, or is it just anecdotal? And that's, I guess that's where I'm coming from, that sometimes there's a lot of things that are done unnecessarily because of a few bad apples. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, if you're familiar with the 85-15 rule, that 85% of people mm -hmm. normally would do the right thing. I agree. And then you have the 15% that are, mm -hmm. quote, the bad apples, and that you deal with the bad apples rather than punishing the 85% who are been in compliance with the rules and regulations without having this ordinance being put, in, put into place. If you're compliant, you won't be you won't be punished. You won't get a visit. You won't. Yeah, but the, the length of the stay will be affected. But though. we have to have something on the books to say. It doesn't have to be six nights. Right? Okay. That's what well, I'm saying. Yeah. Like I said, we'll we'll discuss that later. Yeah. All right. Anyone else, Janet? Just a quick question. Um, exactly. How many complaints has the town of Sebastopol received in, say, the last year? about short-term rentals in homes like we're talking about of those 67 homes when it wasn't the owner who was having the big party when it was a rental person do you know well let's see i got three complaints today in the last year how many have you had um well i think when we all I mean, I don't know. since the beginning of this tour season i would probably get a call a week okay and you checked all those out to be sure it wasn't the owner that was having the party that the neighbor was complaining about, but it was the renter. It wasn't. I'm pretty certain it wasn't the owner. Pretty sure. Yeah. Pretty certain. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the other supervisors or whatever, but. Okay, we really want to move along. Pam, state your name and address, please. Pam Torrance, 135 North 12th Avenue. I'm the owner of JR Vacation Rentals. Sorry. Just one bit of thing. Um, in 2019, the town of Sebastopol received 101,895,000 er, from room tax collection. Now keep in mind, the average days, according to Kim Roberts when I talked to her, in June was 3.42 nights, July 4.2 nights. With that being said, with the proposed ordinance, Days of two to five nights would not be allowed. In turn, the tax dollars would not be collected. How does the town plan to budget that revenue loss? 
Well, we'll talk about the minimum days, I guess, when we get to that in the ordinance. Anyone else? Yes, Pam, please state your name and address. Pam Sadow, 6155 South Shoreside Circle. Um, just a question as to, does the electronic um, correspondence and mail correspondence get written or get read into the record during this meeting for public sake? Well, we've received individual emails. Is that what you're talking about? If there are I emails mean, I'll, or is there a yeah, lot of them? Right. And, and does that get ever written or read into the record so that the public is aware of what those emails are regarding? I think those emails are going to be constant until we get this fine tuned. My thought, and our chairman is here, and maybe he has a better idea, but my thought is I am saving all of those emails into a file. Plus, our clerk has, you know, a perpetual record of everything that goes through her computer. And when we have a public input session, which I think we definitely will have at least one, and invite, you know, everyone who wants to attend and for input, that we could um, sort of summarize those emails at that time, rather than reading them every, you know, reading. 10 emails so legally, every evening. Okay, so legally they don't have to be read into the record as a whole? Is that, I'm just curious. No. Well, that has not been our process in the past, Pam. Pam, they, so. they do get sent to every one of the board. Right. So we all get every document, and that goes, I can tell you, because I read hundreds from the quarry observation as well. But the board and the committee all get copied in on all the documentation. In some cases, we're getting it a couple of times from different people through different sources, but uh, we all are aware of what Absolutely, it is. and I apologize. I just don't know oh, that's what, fine. what the process is, so that's why I asked. No, no problem. Um, and then my next question is, is I do have a letter here from one of the property managers who was unable to be here tonight. Okay. May I read that letter on behalf of her, or is that something that because you have received it via email, you would, it, it is not necessary? Is it long? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty short. It's, yeah, it's, sure. I, I Go ahead. As long as, yeah, as long as we're not setting a precedent here, but no, be my guest. Go ahead. All right. To the Sebastopol Planning Commission, I am a short-term rental property manager, and two of the properties I manage are within the Sebastopol Township, and the ordinance that has been drafted greatly affects those two homes to function as a short-term rental. While I understand some neighbors to STRs have had an unpleasant experience, and I do not condone this type of behavior from tourists or full-time residents, I do believe there are solutions that will give neighbors a place for recourse for those repeat offenders. I think we can work together as full-time residents and STR owners, pro owners slash property managers to help encourage adopting the good neighbor philosophy for the community surrounding STRs, more responsible and responsive property owners along with their property agents. Other things to consider with this ordinance is the financial loss from the municipal budget that comes directly from lodging and the room tax. In 2019, Sebastopol collected over $101,000 for room tax. If this ordinance passes as is, the minimum day requirement and using the sanitary code to limit the number of guests per bedroom will absolutely reduce Sebastopol's room tax budget line. I believe those operating homes at STR should be required to have all permits to ensure their properties are in proper working order, such as the inspection from that cap to a water test for those with wells prior to being used, issued a permit for operation by the municipality and the Durham County Tourism Zone. I do feel it's an unfair overreach to limit the persons per bedroom using the sanitary code as a reason cause for this provision, though I believe there is a compromise there as well and would like to have that conversation at another meeting. I believe in making sure our groundwater and lakes are safe from contaminants. That is where the permits required by DACAP come into play along with well tests in order to pass those state permits from DACAP. I do agree with providing neighbors with a point of contact for complaints. I believe that starting small with a complaint system requiring permits for operations and providing a point of contact is the fair and most economic approach to the issue. You can always build on top of it if the problems are not cured or greatly reduced. 
Due to the lack of public being able to participate via Zoom, watching the meetings online, or read the minutes of the last meeting as they are not posted as of 4 p.m. today, I would encourage this commission to table any action until public input is achievable in a safe way during the COVID-19 pandemic for more transparency. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing about the discussion. Kelly Davidson, rest assured, LLC. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I believe we were handed just a copy of that this mm -hmm. evening. So, thank you. Um, just for your information, when it comes to room tax, it's based on the number of nights that unit is rented. So, for instance, your home is one unit whether you have four bedrooms or 10 bedrooms, that's one unit, as opposed to the motel and lodging and resort type um, recording. So, room tax really has nothing to do with the number of occupants when it comes to short-term rentals. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, then. Number five, if I could, uh, if everyone's had a chance to look at our previous minutes from September 17th of 2020, if I could have a motion to accept and place those on file. I'll move to reduce those. Second. Laird, second by Mary Ellen. Any additions or discussion on those minutes? If not, all those in favor of accepting and placing on file, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Our old business. So we will continue our discussion on a short-term rental ordinance for the town of Sevastopol. Um, we're working towards a draft that we could um, perhaps forward to our attorney for review. And in conjunction with that draft ordinance, we were supplied just tonight with um, some information from Granicus. And in conjunction with that ordinance, this firm is a host compliance service. So I'm going to, um, they would, for a fee, of course, help us with enforcement and regulation and um, how to uh, best serve should we enact an ordinance. So I'm going to turn this over to Hugh Zettel. He is the one that has uh, put a lot of effort into this and he can um, explain what he has learned from Thanks, Thanks. Um Granicus is a, uh, a large company that does a lot of software services for uh, municipalities and government. Um, there's a company called Post Compliance, which was formed in 2015. And they basically are a software firm that uh, try to provide a solution relative to helping municipalities manage short-term rentals. Of course, as with all these things, they start out in the Bay Area, so in the Valley. Uh, of course, where you know Airbnb got its start in um, San Francisco, uh, they were bought in 2019 by Granicus, so they're part of their um, uh, suite of tools that help uh, municipalities manage short-term rentals, which is a, a growing area. Um, they have 355 customers. They start off with large municipalities and have now migrated into uh, smaller communities, towns and counties that are uh, trying to manage uh, short-term rental. Um, for large municipalities, a lot of it has to do with uh, compliance, especially in tax revenue. Actually, I became aware of post compliance by reading an article on Wall Street Journal that in the post-COVID world, with cities, cities losing revenue from restaurants and bars and other things being closed, um, they're going after um, non-compliance with short-term rentals, Airbnb, et cetera, to try to make sure that they're getting uh, the dollars that the road for the ordinances on the books. So that's kind of where that started. Um, and uh, host compliance has uh, several uh, proper or several uh, cities and towns in the Great Lakes area that they cover. Um, um, close to us um, is uh, Green Bay and then also uh, Madison, Wisconsin, which has a, uh, an ordinance in conjunction with Dane County 
Williams Bay, which is one of those villages that's in the town of Walworth, and more recently, the village of Fontana, which is also in now Walworth County. So um, if, if you want to go to page 13, um, one of the things that they did as part of this, they kind of um, do a, a pre-assessment. So they use software as a way to scrub what I think Kim Roberts does manually, Air, Air, Airbnb, VRBO, uh, scrubbing the sites to see calendars, listings, occupancy, those sorts of things. Um, and what's interesting is when we said, you know, we're looking at the towns of Vastpool, they were able to put that within a grid and kind of show the, the number of listings and the number of what they thought were unique rental properties. So because they're hosting this in the cloud, you know, the cost to store this data is, you know, fractions of a penny, um, you know, per megabyte to store this stuff. So they not only had preliminary data showing how much our stuff, our median, the median rental pl uh, price in Sevastopol, 275 bucks, they also kind of split the listings out. So you can see how much data mining they do relative to this is a house, this is a cottage, this is a, uh, a bread and breakfast, this is a hotel, et cetera. So they're able to mine this data. They do it over 50 some um, listing properties, not just Airbnb, they'll do Craigslist, they do uh, Expedia, they do Travelocity, um, they do this both in the United States and they do it globally. So what was interesting is in their kind of pre-assessment for, for the town of Sevastopol, they not only provided 2020 data, they provided 2019 data. So they show what our year over year STR growth was. So to me, that just says that in their existence as a business, you know, they've been, um, they call it web crawling. They've been harvesting data off of these listing sites probably for, you know, since their existence, storing it and then being able to, you know, use this data as they start to you know, market to other towns or municipalities. So they have historical data as well as, um, as recent data, which I thought was um, pretty amazing how much they capture. If you go to um, page 19 in the presentation, they really have five offerings. And I think this is an area relative to where they fit potentially with small towns and municipalities is to do the kinds of things that otherwise you have to hire people to do, whether it's full-time or part-time. Um, so they offer a way to online, enable registration, tax collection. We don't do the tax collection, but there's a way that, that the registration and application process could all be online, for example, and then to save a lot of paper process. Uh, they have a very thorough way of doing uh, address uh, identification. Um, they do uh, compliance monitoring, so they can see when people may uh, list their property for the occupancy that an ordinance requires. Um, and they uh, cite an example that in some municipalities or some large cities, they know when ordinance compliance would be going online to look at sites. And so uh, some owners would change their number of occupants from eight to four, knowing that they're, you know, going, the compliance monitors were looking online, mm -hmm. and then when that period was over, they go back to eight. You know, I, I guess Florida is a hot spot for that, and municipalities are looking at that to try to do compliance monitoring. So they do the compliance monitoring, so it's a way to, me to measure, you know, number of occupants, uh, et cetera, um, that, you know, you know, that, uh, that owners have on, a, on, a, on, a, on that basis, as well as the number of days that are renting, number of stays per week, those sorts of things. So it provides a way for that to be monitored on an ongoing basis um, through the magic of software. Um, they also measure rental activity, so then they can see how, how uh, rentals are occurring uh, based on the online activity for activities that are going, um, where municipalities use this, uh, is to look at occupancy. Uh, in some places, someone might uh, put a, existing bedrooms over a garage, and all of a sudden you see their occupancy rates spike to a different number. Those things could be raised because obviously that's less than what they might be allowed to do. Um, and it's also a way for some municipalities that 
based on the occupants that um, they collect in their data, um, we could go, for example, to the Door County, Door County Tourism Zone Commission saying, hey, we're supposed to get this percentage of tax dollars, but this tool says we have you know, these many occupants in our town. Can you, you know, double check your numbers? So it's a way to provide auditing. Um, this, and the, probably the, the biggest offering they have, um, they talk about is um, a dedicated, uh, they provide a 24 by seven hotline. So they can provide a hotline for neighbors to call if there's issues. It can be through a portal, it can be online, it, through a telephone. Uh, they provide the means for neighbors, you know, if they need to, to take, to, to take pictures or evidence, like, you know, parking issues, you know, garbage spilling over in a can, you know, those sorts of things, document them, um, and use that as a way then to automatically notify the local uh, agent or the local owner to follow up and then they'll follow up with the local owner to see if, if the issue was resolved and they'll also uh, be able to follow up with the neighbor to see if the issue was resolved to their satisfaction. So it provides a, uh, provides a self-documenting process for both um, complaint, um, uh, complaint uh, issuance, complaint management, complaint closure, so that on the, for the town on, on its way to you know, renew a license or to write citations, they have a thorough, you know, kind of audit trail process. Um, the bulk of their 24 seven, they say, is, is handling uh, noise uh, and parking uh, issues. And, and again, it's a tool for the, for the neighbors uh, to call and also a tool for municipalities to also minimize unnecess unnecessary non-emergency calls to be taken by law enforcement. So that's kind of what they offer. Um, they charge on, on basically a per listing um, basis. So, you know, if you look at it from a, a, a town perspective, you know, it would be, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be under $200 relative to this from, a, from an annual subscription for all five of these services. So that's a way from a management perspective, handling things from the enforcement um, to the application to the uh, reminders to the renewals, it could um, be done as a uh, software as a service um, to minimize uh, town resources that way. A lot less expensive, especially on the enforcement side, than say you know what Walworth County's done you know relative to hiring you know basically a, a, a half FTE to do enforcement. So that's. Um, you know, kind of where they offer their services um, so far. That's 200 per rental site? <clears throat> 200, roughly, I just did a, you know, based if I just divided that the number, J, by the 66 we have currently, mm -hmm. that comes up to about 192 per, per rental, obviously less if you have. Per individual have unit, you. Per individual, correct? yes. So there's, yes, I don't know, six houses in one block, that's... It's about fourteen thousand a year. Correct. But it'd be like two hundred, though. I guess I, what I'm going with is Correct. that if the the fee, the five hundred dollar fee, this if you know that stays in, that, that's part of yeah. <laughs> what would go into that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, to cover this. Is I'm that what you're saying? Per correct. It, right. It'd be roughly two hundred dollars. I'm I'm saying there could be an opportunity to lower the fee because there's a more cost efficient right. way oh, to, okay. to administer the licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the biggest one we're getting feedback on is administering the enforcement. So that's, um, so I just summarized it. It's uh, I think 43 pages of presentation, but um, they have, uh, um, you know, I, I think it's, I think the, the thing that's most compelling on this, you know, is the accuracy for the compliance to be able to, to the way they mine the, the websites and those sorts of things on a, multiple times a day, I, I, you know, gives a good way to, to proactively uh, manage that, um, plus the way they can audit trail and manage enforcement mm -hmm. and basically provide a tool for the neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, relative to um, minimizing the hassle they have to go through relative to the you know, as opposed to just dealing with it, being able to do that in a um, in a straightforward way and get it resolved quickly. Mm -hmm. 
I listened to one of their um, short webinars too the other night and I was most impressed because on their panel they included short-term home owners. So they were all working together to find, like I said earlier, this happy medium and I was uh, really impressed with um, how everyone got along. Um, Hugh, I'm looking at page 37. So you have a rust, rough estimate of $200 per short-term rent. I'll call them units, okay? So $200 per unit. Um, there are additional costs. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking like for the dedicated hotline, is that 12, would that be $12 per unit then as well? Yes. I'm guessing yes. Yes. Yeah. So some of these other costs on there, so we're pushing up towards maybe 300 per, per unit, if, if we decided to go with all of those options. Yeah. You know, monitoring, compliance monitoring, things like that. So, yeah, we can um, certainly look at um, the fee. And remember, it's right now we have it $500 as the initial fee, and it's only $100 to renew. Like I said, alcohol beveraging, they pay $400 every year. So, did you have a question, Pam? I do. So, just to, Kim Roberts already does a lot of the stuff that this is going to be doing for you. The software that she has is going, she already knows how many beds are and how many nights that the property is rented when we report to her. So, this is more or less paying $18,000 for somebody to call and paddle on their neighbors. And is this going to be where if the owners are at the property and the owners next door, can the owners call in and complain on the next door neighbors or is this just for short term rentals? We're only addressing short term rentals right now. Okay, so it's more of a tattling site that people can go to no. to no. tattle on their neighbors, but the neighbor next door could be doing something and then there's no Sheriff. The next door, the next door neighbor is not going to get in trouble. Then that the neighbor is going to have to call the sheriff's department, where where your people are going to call this call center, and who are they going to call? Us as the property management, or at that point, are they going to call the sheriff's department? Well, that would depend on who you designate as your um, as your agent or manager. Or right, but to what severity of oh, the property? I mean, like I told you at the last meeting, I'm not going to get a call at midnight that there's a knife fight or there's a some type of a fight and I'm not going to go to the property, I'm going to call the Sheriff's Department. So what type of severity are these, are these calls to this call center? These are not, these, they typically handle non-emergency. Not, not, okay, yeah. but non-emergency would be fireworks, a barking dog would be... Parking. <laughs> okay, but next door, the, the owner could be having a barking dog. So, so who... Who do we call then? The cops? At the We're going to only rent. talk about short-term rentals, Pam. We don't, what your neighbor is doing, if they're short-term rent, renting, yes, then we'll address it. But if it's just your neighbor, we're, we're not discussing that. And, um, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> the Door County Tourism Zone, they're not an enforcement agent. Correct. They make sure everyone has their tourism zone license, they collect the room tax, and they disperse it for administration, advertising, and to the municipalities. That's what the Door County Tourism Zone does. Correct. They do a fantastic job of that. Yes, she does. So, absolutely. this fantastic. would be unique to the town of Sebastopol. Okay. Yes. Uh, this, what did you say the name of the system was that you just described to us? The, the, the corporation now that owns it is called Granicus, G-R-A-N-I-C-U-S. Okay. And, it's, and the company just, is called Post Compliance. Okay, it just seems like there's a lot of data collection that's compiled in what you just explained to us. And as I'm looking over this, it, basically we're talking about noise complaints, minimum night stay, and you use some examples of building codes and garages and bedrooms and stuff like that. Well, the police take care of noise, right? That's, if there's a noise complaint, it doesn't matter if it's a vacation rental or not. Multiple offenses, you call police, right? That's how oh, I would think it. 
And as far as the duration, the night stay, we know that all these fine people just said that they, a lot of their renters are two nights. So that's a loss of money. And as far as the inspection is concerned, the state building inspector takes care of all that. He can come through and he measures hallways, measures steps, looks at, like I said, <coughs> extinguishers and all that stuff. So I don't know that you need to spend that money when that's kind of all being taken care of already. Well, it's a learning experience. Um, you know, we're trying to work through this. We're not the only town in Door County or municipality in Door County that has looked at short-term rental regulations. There's others in the process of looking at it. But you can have regulations and you can draw up your contract, but it just this is all coming down to double payment. We don't. You're, no one's getting rich on a vacation rental. Trust me. You're trying to break even at the end of the year and pay for stuff. You don't want it. I don't want to double pay for everything. So, thank you. Yeah, and I agree with him totally. And I object to having being policed. You know, it just you know it's private property. We do our best to make all the payments and do all the licensing and all, you know anything we're supposed to. But now. Yeah. It's like getting a piece of the pie. Well, yeah. private property in a residential neighborhood, so I think we all need to respect our neighbors. Um, it, it seems to me all these things are true if you have people that are licensed, but we have evidence that people don't have licenses. Well, Everybody sitting in this room has a license. Well, that's <laughs> maybe true. Well, but obviously because you care. Right. And you want to be compliant. And like I said a few minutes ago, we're not trying to shut you down or anything. We just want everyone to be compliant. And that few percentage that's not compliant. But we have to have something on the books to fall back on. Otherwise, it's sort of a free-for-all. So, okay. Hugh, were you done with yeah, the Yeah, I'm done with the practice piece. So. I'll, I'll go into the... Stuff, the analysis the, yeah. part? Okay. So I think you all have this most recent analysis. Looks like this on the cover. Yeah. Everybody have one? Okay. All right. Yeah. I went through this on the uh, September 17th meeting, and there were some questions from the floor um, regarding uh, the gap between DAC cap and, and the Door County Tourism Zone licenses. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I went to get some get some more data just to take a look at that. There's a, a couple things, that, you know, and I'll mention it where I wasn't able to get data from uh, the state of Wisconsin that uh, we're still waiting on. Um, so, so basically, I think the, the question was uh, in our in the initial analysis I did, uh, we looked at the uh, the may report that uh, the Door County Tourism Zone provides on the, the listing of who's got uh, 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 Door County Tourism Zone permitted uh, properties, and we compare that relative to those who had the, the license by the state, you know, which is um, on their website. Uh, that was dated July 2nd, and we had some gaps relative to where we said there was, you know, uh, uh, potentially a large number that uh, didn't have uh, the DAC cap uh, license. And so one of the pieces of feedback, um, valid feedback was, you know, you had a, you're looking at May data and July data, can you, can you get maybe past the data uh, disparities and also can you check to see if COVID put a wrench in things relative to people getting, um, you know, getting their DAC cap license. So that's where this analysis is just kind of try to follow up on that as best as possible. So on, on page four, um, it used to be 67 licenses and, and on, in the middle of the page you kind of see relative to the number of permits for lodging facilities, the vast pool. Um, the uh, tourism zone confirmed there was one non-renewal um, in Sevastopol that was COVID related. Uh, there's seven that are still waiting for follow-up and, and uh, five that haven't filed with the tourism zone, but they're still active online. So I still counted, we're still counting those until we can get that followed up from Kim. So that uh, hopefully, you know, answers that question. 
Um, so the data that I pulled or provided um, was uh, um, from uh, the July 20, uh, a July 2020 report that we got from Kim. So it's a Door County Tourism Zone, actually July data of the poor minute ordinance for the town of Sebastopol. So we were able to try to get at, we could get July to July data lined up with the state. So uh, from that, on the next page, you can it still shows that only 55% of the residential dwelling STRs are licensed by Wisconsin DACAP in, in the town of Sebastopol. So they're operating, but they have no license? Correct. From the from state. From the state. Now the question then becomes, uh, also, well, this is, this is again, COVID-related. Uh, maybe there's just a delay. Um, you know, et cetera. So uh, page six, I uh, did another, again, since I didn't have, my goal was to try to look at the 2019 DACCAT file. Um, I'm still waiting for the state to provide that um, to me so I could compare what DACCAT had on file 2019. But instead what I did is I looked at, okay, for the 30 permits that don't have an associated DACCAT license, um, did they have a Door County Tourism Zone permit the year before, 2019? Did they have one in 2018? And, and, on, and on that, the way I have those aligned, you, you know, the July 2020 to June 2021, that's, that's a DAC cap cycle, right? So you should be able to say, um, for someone who got one in, say, 2018, you know, that's the first start when they started looking at STRs more and, and you had the state regs for ST, for uh, tour, tourism, uh, ro tourism houses after the Act 59. But those 21 in that data, you know, that, those are 21 out of that 30 this year, you know, that still were registered by the tourism zone. And we know the tourism zone, when they put out their, their checklist of things you have to do to get done, you know, one of the things they do annually is they talk about you got to get your state license, okay? So these 30 people that don't have a DAC cap license, they were, they were you know, they, pay, they were, had their tourism zone license, so they probably got notified and said, oh, by the way, don't forget you need to have your DAC cap license because we've seen that in their checklist data. And then likewise, the year before that. So, you know, I'll just say that, you know, for lack of a better word, these are kind of repeat offenders. These aren't people that just say, hey, I bought a house and I'm going to short-term rent it. You know, these are people with the same properties, you know, that have been, you know, noted by the tourism zone to collect revenue tax dollars. So it's not, you know, people that are, that are new to the business. They, you know, they, they, they know the activity and they know the process. So, um, I can't say, I can't say, you know, I didn't know, you know, I forgot, um, because these are, you know, people that clearly have rent this. I didn't go back further, because I just, you know, saw that the number, it wasn't, didn't drop from 30 down to two, and the other 28 is because they got licenses, you know, for the first time that year. These are, I'll call it, you know. Um, so it's obviously a trend and not a COVID. Well, yeah, I don't think it's COVID if, if the people have been renting, you know, going back down to 2018, registered with the tourism zone, but yet didn't have a state license. Yeah. I, you know, that, that's, you know, yeah. that's painfully obvious. So, um, and again, you know, I, we've asked the state, they have not replied yet as far as who manages DATCAT compliance, who's on the hook for, for doing that, obviously, you know, it's the owners that get into it are are supposed to do it, um, but it's um, it's a, a large disparity, and that kind of gets into the um, uh, number seven um, or page seven, just mm -hmm. to kind of put this in the broader context, not just the vast pool, but you know, to point out that we have a a county wide, you know, it's a county wide opportunity. I'll call it. Um, just to give some background, you know, if you look at the DAC cap licenses. Uh, that's provided by the state, Door County has the highest number. I mean, it's 12% it's of a 7,800 plus. And I just showed the top 10, you know, and, and once you get, you know, past the, you know, the top four, you know, Door County is, is you know, is greater than the next four or five combined. So it's, uh, it's a huge population of, of, of short-term rentals. 
um, I was able to merge um, the tourism zone data with the DAC cap data um, just to kind of do a rough estimate relative to all DAC cap licenses. So um, lodge, whether it's a lodge, better breakfast, uh, house, cottage, et cetera. Um, and that just kind of just shows you roughly, um, you know, that we're, we have about a 71% compliance across all of Door County. Again, that's, that's, a, that's a, um, just an estimate of lining up uh, licenses um, with, uh, with those municipalities that, that are defined by the Door County Tourism Zone. And then I took a swag, and again, that's why I call it estimated, residential dwelling STR DAC cap compliance in the county. Um, just to kind of say, is, is Sebastopol good or is Sebastopol bad? And I had to take an estimate of that because um, in the Door County data, they don't tell what kind of licensed facility is. Is it a, is it a tourism house? Is it a, is it a hotel between 15 and 30 beds, et cetera? Um, so the, the, best I could, the best I could do is take an estimate. If you look at Kim data, um, you know, she tells, she shows how many, uh, the number of units you have. And if you have a short-term rental house, that's typically in her table, you know, a value of one, you know, as opposed to a hotel, you know, give the number of units with hotel rooms, et cetera. So assuming short-term rental houses with a unit value of one um, in, in the mix, you know, that just shows you the percentage there. Um, and, um, you know, it just says roughly 67% of the short-term rentals in Door County, if you look at that as a as a as an estimate with the units of number of units of one, um, as a as a baseline, shows that you know a third of them in the county aren't licensed by the state, and you can see where so the fast pool is, you know, versus uh, the rest of the towns. So the fast pool is below average. So, well, it's 55 percent of them are you know, we, th we think are compliant. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the question, you know, the challenge that Kim um, has in trying to find all these data. If you look in the Wisconsin DAT cap, you see there's 974 licenses for all of Door County, mm -hmm. right? If you look in the middle one, if you see DAT cap facilities where we're able to line them up with municipalities, there's only 901. Yeah. Okay. Where are so, those? so where are the other 73? Okay. So DAC cap, on, and and you can do the analysis a different way, where then you find a gap of 50. So somehow in the DAC cap listing, there's 50 properties that aren't accounted for in the Door County Tourism Zone. Can't be. You know, they're, they're, there's just no match. And and um, and so I think that's those are some questions you know relative to the challenge of making sure that you're accounting for all the properties. Mm -hmm. Um, to the point that Pam raised, and, and the thing is you can't, um, without other tools, it's difficult to see all the properties. So we're missing properties, even as blatant as they've got a DAC cap license, but the tourism zone doesn't see them. So that's, to me, that's, um, that's also a, you know, I, I've challenge. got a question for the home renters. Are, are, do any of you think you shouldn't comply with the tourism zone and the state? So I don't see how that's an argument, or you know, that should just be in there, right? I mean, they, they should be compliant with both of them. There shouldn't be any question about that. Right. 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 I honestly cannot remember if it's September 30th or October 31st. You had to pay for this year's license that is normally due, you know, for starting July 1st. They pushed that. Down. And, and just for clarification, you say they, 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 they pushed out the date to which you had to, to pay for that license. So te technically, a person could have had, you know, their first term rental all season, starting July 1st, excuse me, and pay for it because of cash flow reasons or because they've been given that option to not pay for it until, I, I believe it's October, I don't, I don't know if anyone remembers, but I believe it was October 31st, that they have to pay for that license retroactively, and they did that because of COVID for this year. I'm assuming that the data that in the, in the July is probably taking that, that grace period into account. 
Otherwise, you know, there would probably be a large number that would have been declined. But I'll I'll follow up with them on that because I, I asked them specifically about a COVID extension grace period, um, and uh, they haven't replied back. Okay, because, yeah, because like we didn't have to say that we intended to continue or anything of that nature. It just said you have until the the later date, which I forgive you. I don't I don't recall which date it was, but I believe. So in that sense, they yes. ended the ex expiration period, right? So no, June well, it, of I mean, you still had to have, it's still July to July, but you had until October. But for example, if I had just decided not to rent mine out, I didn't, I, you just, you just don't, you wouldn't pay your fee. Right. You wouldn't know that until After later. I mean, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, okay. yeah, so my assumption is, because I know you have that cap license, um, my assumption is with that grace period, they still count you in their July 2nd report as having one. Okay, I, okay. I'm just and asking I, and, if, the, if it would make a difference. Yeah, and I'll, you, I'll follow up. Potentially, again. I could have not rented it out, but yet still be counted as having a license, right. but maybe I didn't even, right. you know, you yeah, wouldn't know right. until after that period whether a person really intended on paying rent for you know, right. retract. So that's okay, um, those, are, those are the updates just based on getting the, the data from from uh, the tourism zone for their July report and alignment. And then just again to provide a, um, a bench, uh, not so much a benchmark, but basically um, mm -hmm. some context relative to where our compliance is in town Sebastopol versus where other municipalities as defined um, mm -hmm. by the tourism zone. Did you want to talk about the sanitary systems and the private on-site water no, treatment systems? Let me just back up a second to what you, um, I think you came in when you talked about all lodging licenses. Now, I just want to, uh, I thought you said 15 units or rooms, you're in a hotel. I think it's five. I, I took a, I just, I was just saying oh, that. Oh, okay. Top I, there's I, like three or four, there's like yeah. three or four lodging right. categories. Yeah, that cap's got mm -hmm. like they've got a this bunch category, of that yes. one, yep. and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was one to four for a residential right. uh, rooming house, if you will. Correct. And if you had five bedrooms or more, you kick into a hotel. Correct. So when people apply, I think, I've never applied, but I, I think they have to indicate, I want, give me the hotel license or give me the right. rooming house license. Yeah. So when you said 15, it kind of threw me a second. Yeah. No, it was just, you know, Okay. The, the one in the middle is just kind of independent of whether the, what the facility is. Right. You can just say who's got a license, whether, I, whether I'm a hotel B or B. Right. right. Just to see that. All in lodging. And then to try to get at short-term rental residential dwellings that's where you have to make an estimate based on the number of where units right. equal one and that's where I, I we i took that as a as a starting point just okay. to kind of get a figure of merit yeah. um, okay but the percentage kind of it makes the percentage kinds of makes sense if you look at 71 percent is high 67 percent is low if you look at the mm -hmm. mix of short-term rental short-term dwelling units that are our houses versus lodges bread and breakfast mm -hmm. etc right there's many 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 more houses right. than there are hotels so um that's where you can see the percentage is still relatively high yeah that i understood i just um was thinking about the number on yeah. the hotel license aspect okay all right sorry about that that's okay mm -hmm. i could have not heard it right too <laughs> and and to go you know one of the points of uh of our ordinance would be that before you get your license from your local municipality we want to make sure you are you are registered with the tourism zone and you have your inspections and whatever and dat cap compliant so that's kind of a double check there um can i ask mr duquesne a question when yes. you decided to rent your property where did you go where did how did, did you know where to start so, no i actually started with I actually started with Marty Olandichek, who was Realtor. the city inspector. Oh, at the time. Because in okay. 2012, the city of Sturgeon Bay, uh, it was kind of in that time frame where they didn't know the direction they were going with rentals. 
And that's how I got in contact with him. He put me to the Door County Zoning, and then I believe that's how I got to you and, and followed that procedure. Yes, I think if we did have an ordinance with our good neighbor policies and all of that, that would certainly be a resource for anyone else contemplating renting their, their home. It would be a starting point. Why not go to your local clerk as your starting point? So. Okay. Should we go to the ordinance? Yeah. All right. Well, we finished with the. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the other the other pages are unchanged. Gotcha. Okay. So I think you all have a copy of the ordinance. Yes, Pam. Can I ask a question? Page nine of this. Yep. Okay. This is off of my website. Some of it. I have a very angry owner because, for one, it shows her address on Glidden Drive, which, I mean, does it really have to? Secondly, it shows her tourism zone permit number and her DAPCAP license number, which, to get that number, you would have had to file an open what's it, reference, request? reference request to get that number because it's not public. It is public. It isn't. I talked to Craig Kretschko. That I number is not. That number is not at all public. I and know. also, you published their address in Illinois. Her mom just passed away. She's very angry, and I'm very angry that. Why couldn't you have just covered it up? If you wanted to use my stuff, you know what? I'm very. I'm honored that you use my stuff. But get the address off of it and their address off of it and their day and their tourism zone and their personal information. I mean, it's really not necessary. I mean, I, I really think that it's wrong that it was done. Because on my website, it doesn't show their address. It just shows Glen Drive. So you got their address off of something else. And I want it removed. All, this, all the data PAMP is publicly available. It is, but you publicized it and it doesn't have to be. You could have kept their address off of it and their home address where their mother just passed away. So for further publications, just get the address off of it and their license numbers. Please. All right. Point taken. Okay. Can we go to the ordinance now? Everybody has a draft in front of them. Draft number five. How do you want to do this? Just go down line by line like we did before. Derek, you're okay with that? I would prefer that. All right. I don't think anybody has a problem with the title. <laughs> <laughs> so we're safe there. Um, I think the purpose is well written you know, protecting the public health, safety, and general welfare, not only of our neighbors, but of your renters and guests as well within the town. Uh, state statutes, yes, it's based on those sections under Wisconsin statutes. And the town does have village powers. Definitions, um, we've, I, th I don't think we've changed the definitions for the last couple drafts, property owner. Resident well, agent means a person who's not the property owner, but who's authorized to act on behalf of the property owner. Residential dwelling, any structure that is intended to be used as a home, residence, or sleeping place to the exclusion of all others. So this does not cover hotels, motels, resorts, and the, and the like. And short-term rental, anything less than 29 consecutive days. Okay, question. Yep. Okay. In um, the last section, this ordinance shall not apply to facilities approved as a hotel, motel, tourist court, rooming house, lodge, lodging, or bed and breakfast as defined by Statutes 97. The only, um, at first when I read it, I was confused because I thought rooming house, we're talking about, right. in essence, 
but it does in 97. I thought, it, I, I was, actually I was thinking if you were possibly adding the word private in front of rooming house yeah. there. I think the, the feedback yeah. from some of the earlier discussions, you know, there was confusion of, um, hey, does this cover a bed and breakfast? Does this cover yeah. a cottage? You know, which it doesn't. And this clarifying language was intended to make sure that people say, hey, it doesn't cover this stuff. Right, but, but it does indicate rooming house, which is right. kind of what the short-term rental is, but the law says Correct. And I think a rooming house, a private rooming house, who does not take right. renters right. on a short-term transient yeah. basis. I was afraid it would confuse me. Maybe yes. and I, I nitpicked it. it no, need no to you're, you're right, and I think... Uh, does that receiving some other feedback, all? I think residential dwelling, when you look at how they define residential dwelling right. in the actual Act 59, um, it, it, it provides language that shows that these others should be excluded. So um, right. it may, this might be one that we talk with Amy about. It was Amy, just but, uh, I think, our, I our might attorney. Be, yeah, and, may, and maybe it would be okay just to strike it if um, the residential dwelling language is um, yeah. And the statute's, you know, good enough to show that yes, these other prop, uh, um, property types are excluded. When I think of rooming house, I think of a. Um, I don't. I don't even know if the city of Sturgeon Bay has any more, but it yeah. was a house, and you could rent just a bedroom. You right. get a room. Okay. I just thought. I, I just wondered. It's clear to me because I read the statute. Yeah. Yeah. No attorney, but I mean, I read it. And it it's clear, but I, I was afraid people might be confused okay. by seeing it again. But I may be all wet. And all right, it, it we will. Again, but. That will be a clarification for our so attorney. Just, yeah, yep. check it out, please. Mm -hmm. That's all for clarity only. Okay. Um, otherwise, we're good with definitions. Number five. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Did you ever look at the number B with the information that I gave you about the agent? Yes, we did. And my take on that is they're not selling the property or soliciting the property. They're the contact. That was my take on it. Now, I, I don't know about the other the owner. No, the property manager. I have to be a right licensed. I have to be a licensed broker to be a property manager in the state of Wisconsin. Correct. So for me to manage any property, I have to be a licensed broker. There are, that's not an agent. It should say residential, it should say a broker. Because like Jana and Lynn, they've hired me as their broker to manage their property. So but that other person can have another person represent them at some point. Right. But if they're he's the agent for that person. But if they're negotiating any type of monies or they're talking about the property, you have to hold the broker's license. We're talking well, about we don't, the purposes of receipt yeah. of notes. Right. We we we're not involved with the exchange of money. We only want a contact person. So I was looking at the back of your notice that says are there exceptions to the requirement? And yes, for example, any custodian, janitor, employee, or agent of the owner or manager who exhibits a unit, um, let's see, what else? Con relative to the rental, terms and conditions, similar information is exempt. So. If that person is accepting rentals and revenue in that, I guess that's between you and your um, rental agency. But for my purposes, I don't see it. I, I don't know about anybody else. Uh, as I said, I think we're just less, we're defining it. Mm -hmm. But the only reason we're defining it because the only thing that they're in there for is for the receipt of notice and the remedy of municipal ordinance yep. violation. Nothing right. else. <clears throat> they're just a representative of the owner personally. For that purpose. For that right. purpose. Just for the right. purpose of. Right. I don't think it's the same. I didn't get it as being the same as 
um, a license, like a real estate yeah. property management company person, agent, broker. Okay, so number five. Uh, that's all pretty standard language in uh, relationship to Act 59, more than 10 nights without a license. License shall be issued for the following purposes. And this would be our process for issuing a short-term rental license. Uh, there would be an application. We have looked at various formats for an application. Uh, again, that would be submitted to our attorney for her input. Um, and the uh, application obviously would need to be completed. Um, and it's subject to um, including some of these other items that we're going to talk about. Clerk would issue the license, effective for one year with renewal periods. Um, if you're non-compliant, the town board may sus suspend, revoke, or reject your license or application. I don't think anybody has any questions on that, the process. Just a quick yes, question. Karen. 10 days stipulation. Um, so would that be the same for the township that you would require the permit for that 10 day? No person, 10 days um, within the year, correct? So you, you cannot offer your place for rent for more than 10 days unless you have a license. Right. That, but also, correct? as well as a, per you're not going to require a permit in the town of Sebastopol either for that, correct? A permit? Well, your permit, this $500 permit. This license, which, yeah, it's the license fee. Okay, the, I, I think the DAC cap is the license. This is either way, but so you're not going to require it for the 10 days just like the state does it. Correct. If they're running okay, less, 10 or less, you're not. Yeah, yes. 10 or less. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So we can move on to number six. I, I don't feel the need to read each and every one of these, but okay. If you're renting for more than 10 nights a year, you need a license. Um, if you're, if you want a license from the town, you shall have a valid state of Wisconsin tourist rooming house license issued by Department of Ag, Trade and Consumer Protection. That's what we call that cap and provide proof of that license with your application. Again, shall be licensed, um, C, shall be licensed with the Door County Tourism Zone and again, provide proof of that license. And now we get into D, each short term rental shall comply with all of the following. No residential dwelling may be rented for a period of six or fewer days. All right, plan commission members, let's start with Hmm. Terry, what's your take on that? Uh, my take on if that. If you want to, if you want to. My take on that, and I brought this up uh, last meeting, is I think that uh, this this is a recommendation from uh, the state. It's mm -hmm. not a. It's mandate. also yeah. It's also the recommendation from Wisconsin Towns Association. Right. They finally posted a short-term rental ordinance, and it does state minimum six days. So sorry. Uh, from what I can tell, you know, we really don't have any definitive or empirical data saying that six days is going to help the quality of the rental. And I think that it's an overreach on the town's part if we require that uh, six day minimum. I think that uh, as you heard tonight, as you got, uh, you looked at the, the various emails and letters that mm -hmm. were sent out, they, uh, they all were, and, and, I, and I counted 11 of them, and they mm -hmm. all were against the six nights, so I think that deserves some consideration as far as uh, something less than six six nights. I don't know what the right number is; could be anything from zero, mm -hmm. but uh, six to me, I think that's going to, as they've stated tonight, that's going to impact the uh, the income number of rentals that are going to be available out there. So that's just my feeling on it. I know Jim had a particular case on the East Coast. You know, I'm not sure you can equate that uh, here in Sevastopol, but uh, I feel it should be less than six. Okay. 
Jay? Uh, I also agree that might be a little restrictive. I think if, if we're going to have these uh, owners, you know, comply with that cap, comply with the tourism zone, the uh, maximum number of people determined by the uh, sanitation department of what can stay there, they're going along with the good neighbor policy. Um, the number of nights stay is, uh, I would think if I'm a owner, I want to have at least two nights, but uh, uh, I think a two, two night minimum would be fine to start with. If we do have a problem with a location or whatever, maybe we go ahead and, as was suggested, we write in there that it can be bumped up if, if that's a problem. Uh, uh, I can understand that, you know, people that rent for six, six days are probably going to be less of a problem than two nights. Uh, however, most of, Jim, most of your examples, uh, the problem with that is, well, that's the owner's problem, that's not our problem. Other than noise, uh, you know, if somebody damages that property, that's, you know, the owner's going to pay for it, uh, not us. Um, so I think if we start out with a two-day night minimum uh, with the option of bumping that up, uh, that'd be the fairest way to go. Again, I would suggest, as I said in my earlier remarks, that anything that you decide needs to be driven by data. Now, it can't be indiscriminate. It's got to be driven by data. And it can't be data out the East Coast. It can't be data out in Door County. It's got to be data collected here. And then you, the, 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 the committee, the council, whoever, has to decide what is an appropriate threshold so if the threshold is, you know, what, after one incident, after two incidents, I mean, there's got to be a very definitive number. It can't just be based on bias or, or on, a, on a personal agenda. It's got to be driven by something much more substantial and much more concrete. Okay. Okay. Hugh? Um, I'm okay with the, the six days. I think we've, with the feedback we've heard, a lot of the context is, um, is especially with the, uh, the stuff we've gotten is, you know, my parents had it, my grandparents had it, we've been in the area, you know, and those are people that knew their neighbors and respected their neighbors. And with 75, 70 some percent of the owners not even, you know, in the area, um, you know, I think, we haven't heard enough feedback yet from actual full-time residents that live here. So I think the, the two-night or whatever, you know, let, letting them explain the quality of life. You know, we've had one in, one in, you got in the mail about, hey, can, you know, can you put a, I'm in favor of it and I live near two short-term rentals and it would be great if we had a rule about fires, fireplaces mm -hmm. and fire safety. And it'd be great if they wouldn't take the, uh, the grass off the sand dunes, you know. So there's, there are a lot of neighbors that we, uh, full-time residents that haven't been heard yet, and, I, and we probably are going to hear from them. So um, I think it's a question, it's hard, to, it's hard to quantify quality of life, but as we've gone through the whole quarry process, you've heard about, you know, I like the rustic, rural feel, low traffic, you know, those sorts of things you don't get when you have houses that are turned over two or three times a week, okay, in, in an area that's zoned residential. So I think that's the part two that we have to balance is, you know, measuring the quality of life from that perspective. Well, the point, the point oh, okay, we're gonna, yeah, we, so, we got your point, Dan, but we need to move along. It's quarter to nine and we'll, so if I, we'll try to get if, through this. If, if, if we look at it from an economics perspective, I, I, and the six days is too onerous, then I, then I think it's a question of, of oh. uh, maybe doing um, a, one you. stay per week. That way you allow the people that come in yeah. through the weekends um, and you can do or, or six days a week or five days a week. But if once you're starting to turn over multiple times in a week, then, you know, Mary Ellen, like your comment a couple of weeks ago, then that's, that's a hotel. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that might be a, a way to allow weekends allow people to come in on a weekly basis, but just do one day a week, however that duration is. Okay, well, we're in, oh, okay, we're in quasi-deliberations here, so we, we're gonna move forward, okay? All right, Laird. 
I, I, after looking at all the uh, information that we've gotten, which again has been all pretty much on one side of the mm -hmm. issue, uh, uh, certainly that, that's entitled to some weight, but I agree with you that, you know, we haven't talked to uh, or had input uh, at this point because we haven't had a public hearing or anything else after if we recommend something. Uh, I'm in favor of sticking with the six days uh, at this point. Okay, thank you. Mary Ellen? Um, boy, I've been going around and around about this for quite some time, and the challenge we're faced with is trying to balance the tourism aspect with the residential character of the neighborhood. And it is these are rentals in the middle of a neighborhood that keeps going back to me, um, middle of a residential area. I have not yet been convinced that uh, we should lower it. I have not been convinced. Therefore, I'm agreeing with at least at this stage of recommending the sixth day. All righty, Derek. I would actually take a little bit different route to this. I would remove the minimum completely, only if we can go with some kind of software filtering, compliance checking, and enforcement program. Um, with that kind of enforcement, look at penalties a little bit higher. Where, you know, there's a three strike rule. So as someone mentioned before, if there was constant violations, you might get slapped with a six-day sure, minimum or something like high that. High fines or something like one of those yeah, letters or adjusted. Forfeiture of the license for so many years. Okay. There was a one communication, boy, if I recall it correctly, but the person said that she kind of was okay with wanted the three day, but during the busy months of July and August, she herself, as the landlord, has a, I think she said a seven night. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which was uh, one way to look at it. And then as possibly a compromise situation. Or as one of the gentlemen said about uh, start at three, if it goes to heck, increase mm -hmm. on the violators um, to a six day. Another idea, compromise mm -hmm. aspect, possibly. So a penalty clause or something. Mm -hmm. I guess, do you think that the problems that we hear the most complaints about, if those are they directly tied into the length of stay? That's what I kind of mull over to. If there's a real crackdown on all the other regulations and whatnot and so on, would that take care of it? Would that cut back on the turmoil that seems to be caused? So we're hearing mm -hmm. from the shorter term rentals. I don't know, I, it's something I mull over. I do re okay, anyone else? I do recall someone saying, well, we have this minimum which has cut down on the party houses. Um, so my take on this is, and I'm gonna go back to Walworth County. Um, they have a minimum of six or seven night stays, but somebody said, asked the question, do I need to rent it for six days? Do I need to rent it for seven days, um, as in the owner? And their answer was, no, you don't need to rent it the entire six days. So if somebody calls and wants to rent your home and you say, well, you have to rent it for six days, that's not what I'm thinking. I think the purpose of Act 59, again, it was a compromise between hotels and motels and the realtors, okay, you can rent your home, but it's going to be, you know, for long periods, not a revolving door. So if 
what do you think about something that as long as you only have one group of people renting the property in a six or seven day period so someone could call and say hey I only want to rent for three days I only want to rent for two nights and that would give you the option to rent for a shorter term but you're not going to have that constant turnover every other night so you know the, the number of days they actually stay would not matter but for example if you have a rental from Friday to Monday as long as you don't have another renter till the next Friday you'd be in compliance so you wouldn't I, th I think you're missing my point. No, because if the person stays Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, if it's a week, it's okay. Friday, Friday. All right, and then, then there. Your checkout would be Monday. So you well, know, within so within okay within a seven day period. It's it doesn't have to be Monday through still Sunday. Month. Well, I think we could work around that if we wanted to. That sounds like a logistic nightmare to to monitor. Oh, it is. Yeah. Well. well so would so would a minimum of six days. Hold on. If that's not workable, then um, I'm going to stick with the six day minimum. That would be my choice. One question, or okay. one comment. I think a lot of these questions were just, like, you kind of answered them yourselves. The fact that we haven't heard from the public, I think is a very good thing. Um, I, I would love for you to go interview all my neighbors down on Bayshore Drive. Um, but the fact that you haven't heard a lot from the community, I think is a very good thing. Um, but we have. <laughs> well, it, and you, you, no matter what, you're going to have something. Okay. All right. And then okay. We talk, All right. We talked about one week, one rental a week. Mm -hmm. So, if I want to rent a Friday and a Saturday to this young couple with their kids, and the following Friday and Saturday to a different couple, okay, that's two rentals within a seven-day period. Correct? Mm -hmm. You can't try and like go at this in little pieces. If I have someone on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm going to lose both weekends. Mm -hmm. yes. So I think we're making this really, really complicated. What's your average stay? Uh, Is it two nights or three nights? I would say five, four. But, but October, May and October are big months for me, even though it's the weekends. Because I need them. I can't, I can't, I'm barely breaking even, so I have a big mortgage on it, so. And, and then are you going to change the Door County zoning regulations? Are you going to petition Door County to change all their stuff? Because that's what we did all this work following well, to get to this point. Zoning had to change their ordinance to accommodate the Act 59. They had to delete some of their regulations so that you were allowed to rent in short-term rental. Okay. okay. Well, all our current places are built around the Door County zoning. Permitted. All right, so <laughs> I'm for one rental per week, no matter how many nights, or six day minimum. Okay, well, should we move along? We'll yes. come back to that one. How's that? Or let it go to public hearing and see what's going Yeah, on. or go to public. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's one we leave blank and when we have our public input. Got to go public um, input and see what that's Yeah, what's but we on. are hearing from the other side. Believe me, we are hearing from the other side. And we only hear when there's complaints. Well, you're going yeah. no matter what. Right, you're so. One question, Tammy. <laughs> It's nine o'clock. I get it, but this is our livelihood. 
So I know yeah. you want to go to bed. This is my livelihood. No, I don't want to go to I bed, but I want to stay on point too. I do too. I get two night rentals. That's the majority of mine. Okay. My rental is in the middle of 60 acres. Mm -hmm. In Sebastopol, it's not like we have houses on top of each other. So why is everybody being penalized for, you're only gonna get calls if it's a complaint. The neighbors aren't gonna call you three times a day just to say, oh, I'm a really nice renter. Of course, your job is just taking the right. complaints, but yep. that's all you're focusing yep. on. Mm -hmm. Instead of listening to everybody that's here, mm -hmm. we are here to try and represent ourselves. And I understand none of you may have a rental, but this is our livelihood. We choose Door County and we're trying to make a living here. And a six night minimum is gonna put us all out of business. It will put us out of business and it will be close to $100,000 that the town will not have. Well, just remember the original intent of even allowing short-term rentals to begin with. It was a compromise between the hotels and the motels and you as a private is homeowner. Is this a personal thing for you, though? Or no, is it's not a personal thing, thing for me. It seems, it's, very, it seems very personal because you're very short and snippy with many of us, and it's, it's very apparent. Well, I'm trying to stay on point. So, Okay, we're not going to have any more questions. Um, not right now. I'm sorry if I seem snippy, but we're going to work through this and we'll see what time it is and then just hold your questions, okay? Okay. B. Oh, wait, now, where are we? Yep. You're there. I forgot right. where I am. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, D3. 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 Okay. All right. Is everybody, I'm assuming everybody was okay with no campers, vehicles, or whatever, tents. You don't have any problem with that, I hope. Um, okay. Each. Uh, if the property is not served by public sanitary sewer, it has a private on site water treatment system in compliance with this ordinance and in compliance with Chapter 21 of our Door County Code. So that's pretty standard. We can fall back on the county for that one. If it has a public sanitary sewer, occupancy is limited to the number of occupants. Again, that's according to DATCAP. So we would just follow their standards. Hugh, please chime in if I'm missing anything as I move along here, Yep. or as we move along. Okay, so we shorten that up quite a bit. We're going to rely on DATCAP and the county sanitarian, correct? Correct. It, it, I think the, we kind of um, modified this a little bit um, because of, we kind of had occupancy and we had the, the, the septic kind of wrapped underneath the occupancy. Um, what we did is we actually looked at Walworth County's language and kind of adopted uh, their language relative to um, making sure that the priority of the, of the pouts of the on-site septic, having that in compliance, and then you know the property, if it's from an occupancy perspective, you use DAT cap or whatever the septic is from an occupancy of number of bedrooms and two persons per bedroom, whichever is smaller. And that's basically kind of mirroring their language. And I kind of redid this language because uh, County of Wal Walworth County was sued um, because they had similar about being making sure you can only rent your property to what your sanitary system was designed for. So they were sued. Uh, it went to U.S. District Court um, in 2019 and it was a summary judgment uh, to the county relative to being able to um, make sure occupancy is only for what the the pouts is designed for. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so uh, Murphy versus Walworth County, if you're interested in looking at that. Um, but that's, um, that's our, it's, it's um, our argument with the U.S. District Court relative to, to testing their language and their ordinance. Okay, thank you. Sufficient off-street parking. We did find the ordinance that uh, regulates parking on town roads. So um, there is no parking in front of a public or private driveway. There's no parking on any paved surface. 
So I think we're good there. Um, it also talks about parking in the comprehensive zoning ordinance at the county level. So does anybody have a problem with parking? Hopefully not. All right, pets. One of the complaints I received today was a barking dog for four hours while the people that were renting were away from their home. So, um, must be under the control of their owner and on a leash when outside the dwelling. They can use a, a pulley or a tie out. Um, minimizing pet noise, again, uh, don't leave your pet unattended. We have a town ordinance regarding animals and um, keeping them under your control and um, when they get out of hand. So again, we'll rely on town ordinance for that. Any problems with the pets? Anything you need to add or? No, no. Signage, pretty much out of our control. It's uh, governed by the Door County Zoning Ordinance and any town ordinances we have. Uh, rental dwellings, this was an issue, uh, especially with some of our cell phone service. <clears throat> rental dwellings must have reliable telephone communication in case of emergency. Outdoor events, uh, quiet times. Any comments on that? Uh, property, okay, number E. Property owner must reside within 75 miles of the short-term rental during the periods of which the short-term rental is rented. This requirement is waived if there's a valid agent point of contact located in Door County. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. To qualify as an agent, you must reside in Door County or be a corporate entity with offices located in Door County. And the prop number F, provide the town with current contact information. All right. G, <clears throat> um, on the premises, we are suggesting property rules, um, call them good neighbor policies, whatever. Um, we talk about that a little later too. Um, neighborhood association standards, conducts, things like that. Anybody have a problem with that? H, again, providing information to your neighbors so that they have a point of contact. That was one of the things that was talked about um, with Granicus, that the owner should be involved and invested in the community and, um, you know, paying attention to what's going on in your neighborhood. Uh, a telephone and email contact, good neighbor guidelines. Oh, yeah, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, B, since <laughs> the change was made to property rules and property rules for consistency, yeah, add would we yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. correct that to property rules? Yeah. We mentioned property rules once before, didn't we? Yeah, just before yeah, that. It's two just two times forgot prior. Forgot to change it there. Property rules. Yes. Okay. Yeah, under G above. And I just, mm -hmm. for consistency okay. sake, that's all. I caught that. Yep. And provide their DAT cap license number. The reason we ask for that, if there is a complaint and someone wants to make a complaint to DAT cap, um, they like to have the license number. So, so would you have the renewal be after the, the state renewal? So like the town's renewal would be maybe like September? So that way they have all the paperwork in place for the, the spring renewal or? I think Karen, the being consistent, everyone seems to be on a July 1st to June 30th timetable. Right, but I'm so, just saying by the time that the individual gets their license okay. from the state to then provide it to you, I would just suggest that you stay for a month or two after the, the state renewal. Well, I think anybody that's existing already would have their sure. cash sure. license. I'm talking about the renewal. So anybody coming new into the short-term rental field obviously would have to get a new permit number and be, you know, maybe outside of that time frame. But are you going to have the towns be, like the state is once a year, 
Or is it going to be everybody that is in the town going to be once a year at the same time? Well, right now the period runs July 1st to June 30th. Yeah. We might have to figure out some of those logistics. And maybe this company or you know, one of the other yeah. towns yeah. that has this ordinance can yeah. help us with that. So, um, just like if somebody, you know, wanted a, a building license, they can come in anytime. So. Okay, and um, the proper, the homeowner's liability or business liability insurance, um, you homeowners might want to check with your insurance company to be sure that you have the correct declaration and coverage because I've heard of some insurance companies, if you're renting your home, that's a business and you had homeowner's insurance, so you might want to clarify that with um, your insurance agents that you're covered. Uh, and then we go into the penalties, which, you know, we, if we need to issue a citation or invoke a penalty or enforcement or whatever. And number eight, the fees. Do we want to talk about the $500? Do we want to think about reducing it? Do you think it's fair? Oh. State is 300 you said? To start. to start. And then it's uh, 110 every year after. But that is for him to actually go into the property and make sure that there's smoke detectors, carbon dioxide detectors, fire extinguishers, water test, things like that. And how about the county tourism? Is that the for that? There's no fee for that. No fee for that. So it's state plus our whatever we put on there. Mm -hmm. And as Hugh mentioned earlier, the fees kind of range all over the place. Um, I think I looked at Brown County, that was like at 250, and some of them, some of them are 650, and... Madison was... Well, Sturgeon Bay is 100, right? Initial and then yearly? And yeah, Sturgeon Bay is $100 per year, whether it's renewal or new or not. Um, some of them are four or 500 up front, and then the renewal is less I believe Bailey's Harbor was talking about um, here's one from Bayfield County that was a hundred and ten dollars I don't know why they put the ten in there and Lincoln. yeah Bailey's Harbor had left theirs blank. Yeah, I think the. So, uh, Linda, I think you know we could leave it there or leave it blank. You know, now that we're getting some data relative mm -hmm. to what it takes to administer this, mm -hmm. you know, even if we didn't do the enforcement, you know, some of the other tools to to minimize, you know, resource, mm -hmm. um, for managing that within the within the town, we could probably you know look at reducing. Um, reducing this, but I think uh, Walworth County provided a good benchmark relative to all the things that were listed in their pro forma, and we could take a look at those okay. and just uh, review that with, uh, with what Amy. Did, what did you think the total cost, if we went with this host compliance service, what did you say that was? 40000 No. It's around between 14 and 20. 14000 13 to 15. Right. Well, I, yeah, I'd I'd certainly think about adjusting the fee, Mr. Chairman. Well, I was saying on the monitoring thing, I saw when I sampled it out, it's around 9 grand. I must be missing something. I use 80 dwellings. No, you would. Uh, Times 300. 80, uh, I mean, that was older of what you had, but yeah. So I thought I had around 9 grand. Yeah. So you want to take and if you implemented that, you want to run on a low profit. We're not trying to make money on it, but yeah, the goal is, yeah, it's just plus an admin fee, right. admin, and then right. you're going to have legal fees and that right. sort of thing. So, um, I think if you get, yeah, I think that's where we can probably scrub that number or probably lower it. Just based should on we number. leave it blank or should we fill in a number or? Well, it seemed at 500, so unless there's no some data to really back us up, I think we might be better to leave it blank. Or, we, why just don't the we initial or what? Or all of them. 
Well, the $100 renewal is certainly fair because that would require yeah, some administration mm. time and paperwork and things that's like that. That's understandable, and you can't argue with that. Yeah. And back to the Granicus, if we had a software program, I think we ended up, it was like $300 per unit. So 300 times 70 would be 21,000, I think. So. Yeah. so you're thinking of leaving? Well, let's leave it. Are you okay with leaving it blank for now? Yeah. Right, just line 184. When we have our. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just that one. We'll leave it blank for now. Okay. Okay, okay. and late fees and okay, and I think everything else on that page is pretty standard. Okay. Comments. Yes, Jan. I, w I wasn't clear from the discussion how many days you decided to put into the ordinance as a minimum. We didn't. <coughs> So we have, let me see, all right, one, two, three, right now we have four that are okay with keeping at six days, but potentially negotiable. I sure hope you decide us to let us have two days, because that's the difference of either making it or not making it. Because when we can't do our weekends, we need our shoulder seasons to make our numbers come out at the end of the year. And our shoulder seasons are weekends. They get there on Friday when the kids get done with school. They leave on Sunday when the football starts. That's... Well, I've seen ordinances that have, that don't have a minimum at all in it. It's really terrible. Mm -hmm. Stuart, did you Based on Stuart debate for auxiliary buildings, right? And they're uh, auxiliary dwellings mm -hmm. in the residential have seven days. Our seven days? Who is that? Sturgeon Bay. City of Sturgeon Bay. No, they're not. Auxiliary. No, they're not. Uh, it's two. For the auxiliary dwelling? Um, auxiliary dwelling? Yeah. Auxiliary or accessory? It's, it's a, the, auxiliary or accessory. On the premises yeah, where you can rent them. It's another yeah. building on the premises. Yeah. They have a... Um, well, like I said, Wisconsin Towns Association recommends six, but... Um, I'm asking, please. Yeah, like I say, is, is, is that that we, don't put, or we don't put anything. There's, no, there's nobody that wants to have a party group in there. If anybody wants a rental, nobody wants trash in their rental. I'm just saying, nobody wants a trash. I can tell you, we've been doing this for over over four years now, and I believe that. You know, keep in mind, we're their manager of properties, so I think everybody else does as well. I've been doing it 26 years. I bet too. <laughs> well, can we... Okay, I'm looking for a suggestion here. Linda? Yes, sir. Can I throw two cents? <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. Um, well, first off, I'd like to just tell you all that I, I think you've been doing a great job with this. It's not an easy topic. This comes in right behind the quarry issue, which I know we all had a lot of fun with. Very Did you want to state your name and yes. who you are? <laughs> Sorry, I'm Dan Wolfel. I'm chairman somewhere up there. Um, and I think, you know, I looked at this thing today and over time, and I think there are three or four key things that, that you have suggested or will be suggesting to the town that makes sense. Uh, like the good neighbor rules, uh, things that will make a difference, and making sure that everybody is on the same playing field when it comes to licenses, because I think you've revealed some information that is pretty surprising, at least to me, and maybe to some of these people here who are paying license fees and the, their counterparts are not, uh, and or they're renting without being a member of the tourism zone. But with all of that being said, my take on it is, is that I would walk just a little bit slower on the implementation for nights. You got, a, you got the basics of a good ordinance here, which, assuming the attorney you know, would get it back in, in a form that's acceptable, would put a, a two-night minimum on it, knowing that if we have problems, if this doesn't address most of our problems, it would be real easy to come back, change the ordinance, strike two, and write six or 
put a different penalty clause in that addresses it. I, I think much of our problem resides in the fact that people don't have a contact point, a next door neighbor, mm -hmm. when there's an issue. And I think this will address a large degree of that, at least that would be my hope. So I would tend to just say I would encourage you to think about walking first, knowing that we can always come back with the hammer. You, you got an ordinance that wouldn't necessarily be needed to change other than the number of nights. Um, and then as for using the software, uh, which is fine because we have, as you all know, one employee. She can only do so much. So if we use the software, then we recover the cost of the software and an administrative fee. So we adjust the fees as needed, what you think is appropriate, and then you work from there. That would be my guess. But you're going to have to make that decision and then in turn come back to the town board and let them make the final call. So that's just my input. And. Um I'm sure we can expect at least one public input session. Um, oh, absolutely. I've heard from some neighbors that are insistent on the six-day minimum, but we'll see, I guess. Um, well, I guess we got to start somewhere, but I mean, it's not fair. We have to balance. We have to look at the whole community and where I'm going. You know, and that's the difficulty, the challenge that we face is to try to make it as effortless as possible for everybody. Because you, you do have short-term rental situations, usually in the middle of a residential area, and that is a cause, could be a cause for friction. There are bad apples, the complaints that Linda has talked about, you know, rent it for four people, let them show up, and the cars are all over the road, you know, that kind of a thing, and uh, et cetera. So the challenge we face is to try to get to a balance that most everybody can live with. And uh, the I'm glad Dan brought that up, because the ease that it isn't in stone per se. We, there are some sections we can look at again. Um, it's not do or die, you know, type of a situation this evening. So I'm glad you said something about that, Dan, that we could. And we will have a public. We will meeting. have a public hearing if it goes right. to the point that we're going to have an ordinance. So there will be input from both sides, right. uh, not just one side like you mostly hear tonight. Mm -hmm. so. The only other part of that that you mentioned, which I think is probably. Uh, another workable part, if we went with the lower uh, number of days, too, as you suggested, is if they're the graduated penalties, or if it's a second or third offense for the same party, then maybe just revoke their rental license. Right. Yes. Yes. There are, uh, yes. there are yes. options. Yes. So we, we punish the yes. yes. and cause a problem rather than everybody else. Because then there's people that operate without a license to begin with. Right. That's where some of that we'll make them get a license. Yeah, that's what the software. That'd be their penalty. Yeah. We gotta remember if we don't have any of that software filtering, we're not gonna enforce anything. No. So if we can make it a, a, a complaint based system, we could remove the nights completely. And you think that would take care yeah, of it? And do it as a penalty basis. That's a thought. <laughs> Well, what is your pleasure? Just leave it blank for now until we yeah, get public I, input from every from all sides and I put a DVD there. <laughs> to, be, to be determined the route we go on that issue. That's really the one that's really contentious. Yeah, that's the primary one. Heads and minutes. Alright, Linda, I'm just gonna say one more thing. I keep on hearing that this sounds like a, per, a personal agenda. I don't know where it's coming from, but there's a personal agenda here. As a board member, as a council person, you should be checking your personal agenda at the door. 
What this town needs to do is establish its own best practices based on the input of what you're getting here and from other from other stakeholders, from Sebastopol. Not from another county, not from another part of the country, but from here. You have to have structural processes in place, but I'm hearing all night long, it just frustrates me that you're building this ordinance around a house of cards. And if you're going to do this thing right, you've got to do it with some really sound data. And it just feels like that somebody has made this their own personal agenda at the expense of the rest of the people in this room, as well as other people who weren't able to show up tonight. So I really would encourage this, <coughs> this committee to really start looking at your process about how decisions are made. And this idea of critical thinking has got to be first and foremost in, in, in your minds. I mean, who are you serving? Are you serving yourself? Or are you truly serving the citizens here of Sebastopol? And if you are, then how do you back that up? Do a survey. Find out what people are saying. Collect information from people. Do a kind of a, an assessment, uh, needs assessment regarding this issue. And find out from the people what their concerns are. And then you drive an ordinance in with data, not by, by luck. Well, we've been working on this. Since it doesn't sound like it. September it sounds like I've heard a lot tonight, and I, I'm a process person. I have been my entire life, and I think that decisions need to be much more soundly made well, rather than like from I the said, head. We've been looking at it for over a year. For over a year, trying to come research, up with something to keep everyone happy. Research is something that's lacking here, for sure. Um, I, I beg to differ because uh, I think we've done a lot of research. And that's fine. I agree with the gentleman who said that a lot of the problems are going to be solved by requiring everyone to be licensed in the first place. Yes. Yes. And, and the second thought on that is I can't speak for anyone here, but I bet you that what I say they would agree with. If I had a rental and it was two weeks and I have some, I have some three week rentals and I got a report that they were a nuisance to the neighbor, they wouldn't be coming back again. If it's two days or six days, if it's a problem, I'm not written to those people anymore. And so I'm not sure that the day makes a difference, except that there are some people whose livelihoods will go down the tube, and it'll be your responsibility for that with, as he said, no data. But if you start with two nights, for instance, and then you give it two years so that there would be time if you had a two-nighter who was a pain in the neck, that you just got rid of that person um, and then kept a database so that, you know, if you say, this guy started a fire when he wasn't supposed to, I want to know that if he's going to rent my place. Um, I think you would solve all that and keep the livelihoods that you have here. And if that doesn't work, then come back and change it like the gentleman in the gray shirt whose name I don't know, but the he's our county chairman district. It's not that big a deal. It's not written in stone like it can never be changed ever, you know, unless God comes down and blesses it. It just takes a meeting and a public hearing and you can change it from two to six days. But in the meantime, you haven't wrecked the livelihood of at least some of the people here and I don't know how many more that aren't in this meeting. And I think that deserves some consideration. Okay, let me take a survey of of the owners that are here. Is that your only point of contention, the six days? Yes. 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 No, occupant, I don't think, occupancy numbers are controlled by DAPHAP and the sanitary system. Or the sanitation department. So we're changing the sanitation change department's ruling. Right. Well, it is, but well, I, when I talked to John Teichler, he said that's only for short term because I said, well, now if I sell a piece of property or somebody lists a piece of property in Sebastopol and they want to rent it, and I said, well, now you have to disclose to them that, well, guess what? Now if you buy a two-bedroom house, you're only going to be allowed to sleep four people there. Well, if my properties, nine times, I mean, probably all of them that I represent in Sebastopol only rent from June until October, so they're only using their sanitation because, like Jana, she leaves 
in October and doesn't come back until the next June. So the property is sitting empty for those six months, so your sanitation isn't using as much as what, have you, what they would have used the whole entire year. So beds and heads shouldn't really matter. It should be how many nights you're sleeping in that well, year because you guys are probably putting more waste. I was probably putting more waste in my home than if I slept 10 people for four weeks in their property. So what does that matter? We, we do not, I'm looking at section six, number four, occupancy is limited to the number of occupants authorized by the license issued by DATCAP and they or care. the Door County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. So, and they don't care. Well, that cares they about care. the number of uh, the, uh, the sleeping rooms and the density of people people you have in a sleeping room. But right, they right. but they don't they don't license your property for only how many people are how many bedrooms you have. They don't care if you put four people in a bedroom as long as there's enough airspace that is Correct. in that bedroom. Correct. So what does it matter on the sanitary part? On the sanitary, they on the sanitary they have in um, in that chapter. Because we, we asked them about that question, Pam, about do they look at the, the pouts and the pouts capacity? And they say that that's, uh, that's not their jurisdiction. That's John Teichler? Pardon me? Yes. John Teichler, you said? Yes. yes. So that right. When I talked so, to him, that's what he said, too. He said it's all of the municipality that if they want to do it. So it's but, up to you guys to say, no, we're not going to write that in. We don't care how many people sleep in the property. <laughs> if if it's your round or if it's, like I said, if you look at, if you get your numbers from Kim Roberts on how many people are staying in the property, she can tell you how many nights the place was rented for the whole entire year. Well, so okay. it, should, it should go off of that, then off of how many people are in a property. Because again, selling property in, in the town of Sebastopol then is gonna go whoop because a lot of people are buying here to rent their properties out. So at one point, they can move here to retire like a lot of people have. Well, the, I'm looking yeah, at a memo. DACAP, DACAP, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 7210, section five on private sewage disposal um, basically says, you know, the last the system shall be located on the premises and shall be designed, constructed, and operated in accordance with um, sections uh, or with the, the code uh, 382 and 383 which governs private on-site sewage treatment systems which in 383 it talks about you know uh, number of bedrooms in a house and two persons per bedroom and they have in the and that's in that statute the gallons per person per day that goes into that assumption of two persons per bedroom Okay. And but Craig Kretschko doesn't care, and it's not on their license state for the state. I'm looking at, I'm looking at a, a note from John Teichler that says, um, the county does not exceed the code requirements. Any more occupancy of more than two people per bedroom would require a variance from the Wisconsin Administrative Code. But they don't enforce it. Well, well but that doesn't... You know, that's, it that's doesn't, it's not, it's right. something that each municipality, like I'm saying. And I think and what we're looking at is to get the number out there that is consistent for your advertising. So for a three bedroom home, you're advertising six people and somebody else got a three bedroom home and they're advertising 10 people. And that's not what we, you know, you got to have some type of consistency there. Well, not, I mean, again, it, it doesn't really matter. It's how much sewage is going in. Well, it, in that it does matter. Time. It does. Maybe they're not checking it, but it does matter. Mm -hmm. Right. You, know, you don't have to. You don't have to follow the speed limit if you don't want to. Correct. It doesn't matter unless you stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But I'm, I'm just saying it's something that you guys have to approve. It's not something that the county cares about. Because, like I said to, to John, if I bought a two-bedroom house and I decided to bring my family of ten. They can't tell me I can't buy that house that live there. But it's my personal residence yeah. at that point. That's what I'm saying. Okay, well, we, the plan commission was okay with number three and four as it stands. So, um, again, we will have public, at least one public input session where everyone will be invited. And ultimately, the plan commission would make a recommendation to the town board 
the town board is the ultimate decider on the ordinance. So, when that happens, would you have a Zoom meeting so people that aren't allowed to be here that they would be able to voice their opinion? Because a Zoom meeting right now with the pandemic and a lot of people aren't traveling, I think that would just be appropriate. And I know people had asked for tonight to be a Zoom meeting no. or even a call in meeting. I'll leave that up to the town board chairman. Town to be, board to be determined. To be determined. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> do we need to bring this back? with these few changes. Um, okay, let's go back to D. Shall maybe rent it for a period of blank days or fewer. D. I'm D1. sorry, section D1. six. Six. D1, no residential dwelling may be rented for a period of blank days or fewer. We'll we, have, we have four people okay with six, but negotiable. I'm negotiable, I guess. I, I prefer I six days, but leave it in there for now and see what our attorney says. See if she has some experience with other municipalities as far as abiding by that. Or... Okay. How many in favor of leaving it blank? I'll leave it blank for now. For now, yeah. Okay. Terry, or I'm Jane. You. Uh, blank is okay. You prefer I, I two. Think it should be two. Okay. Yeah. Blank days or fewer. I mean, we're not the final decision. Any. Nope, we're not. That's right. And and I, I'm anxious to um, get some legal input on that as well. To see how that has gone. Am I too ahead of ourselves to say I think we're ready to have it go to the attorney? Okay, and then the other, uh, the only other change was on page one to check if, to see if we needed to add private in, in front of rooming house. Um, um, I think on 37 and thir on 38, that whole sentence I read, that it's basically the type of lodging. I'll just work with Amy and see whether we even need that. Because residential development in the statute may, yeah. by definition, say we don't need that, mention those others. Okay. Well, that's fine because I thought it was added in, but yeah. I didn't think it was really because we were stricken in the earlier. Yes, sir. You're going to take that yeah, out about take, take it what out. it does yeah. not apply yeah. to. So Sounds good to me. You'll yeah. submit back to us a clean ordinance without, right? Yeah. Sorry, okay. yeah. Does the board want to see a clean draft of this before we send it to the attorney or do you want the attorney to take a peek at it? Well, I'd like a, a clean version of this with all, whatever other changes that you might make and uh, I don't have a problem sending it to the attorney then. But just, you know, okay, a clean copy for the next board meeting or a for clean copy and send it off to the attorney? We send it off to the attorney, I think. Okay. Start there. All right, so I... Um, I think Jay would, was anxious to make that motion. Or? Oh, wait, one more. Okay, one more. You were going to, on uh, 8, you were going to uh, make a change to leave blank the initial Oh, blank fees, right. And then uh, line 135, provide a copy of property rules. Oh, yeah, and change that to property rules. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, I guess I make a motion that uh, with the changes we've just discussed, uh, we get a clean copy and send it to the attorney. I'll second. All right, second by Derek. Any other discussion for now? All right, all those in favor of sending it on to the attorney for review, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no opposed, motion carry. So, so, we will get a clean copy to everyone and to our chairman. And um, Mr. Chairman, does it matter to you who reaches out to Amy Sullivan? No, no. So, 
Hugh, do you want to take that under your wing? Or What's that? To, to get it to Amy Sullivan or get it to oh, this okay. Amy and yeah, Amy yeah. can yeah. send it? Okay. Yeah. So you'll send a clean copy to Amy, our clerk, and Amy can send it to the attorney. Yeah. Do we know when the duration of this is off? Because like next year, next summer, I have multiple weekend bookings. So this whole two thing is going to just kill me. So it's not going to happen overnight because in acting well, an ordinance. I need to know what to tell them. Well, in acting an ordinance is a problem. Is a process. I mean, if we have at least one public hearing and we would have to publish it before we um, will there be any publish notice? What grandfathering? And I don't know about grandfathering. Grandfathering did come up, I know, in Act Fifty Nine, but. Oh, you mean grandfathering as far as renting for two nights? The reservation. Yes, the reser right. You're talking about reservations. Yes. Okay, not something that was operating prior to 2017. No. Okay. This is very hard because we followed every rule to get to this here. You know, we had to come here to say you did it wrong yeah. or you're going to So I have a half a million dollars invested in Door County that we just pleaded our case, all of us. Well, and I don't have a half a million dollars. So. We compliment, now what do I do? we compliment you who are abiding by the rules. Yeah, that, but that again, is. we're the ones getting the complaints from those that aren't abiding by so the rules. So why don't we take so. a slower approach and yeah. the two nights instead of... Well, we're going to leave it blank, okay? We're going to leave it blank for now. Away. That doesn't help us with how we address mm -hmm. these people that are giving us money as a down payment. They're booking well, out next summer to one year from today. So I guess I, if, if there's any way you can come up with something for a year to get us through, but, do you understand? You know, like we said, we're really only hearing one side right now tonight. And that's what, if you, what if we have a majority of neighbors that come and say, no, we insist, and we haven't broken we insist any laws. on six and we've days. And we follow all the zoning and the... You know, we're kind of in the middle too. So. Right, and I understand that. But as of right now, none of us have done anything wrong. Good. Okay. Glad to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, Jan. I uh, one thing. You have everybody's email address here because we had to give it to you when we signed in. Would you please send a clean copy of the regulation as it's going to the attorney to each of us here? We will try to do that, Jan. But our clerk is very busy right now. We'll getting post ready. It on our town website. Oh, okay. Post on the website. There you go. Okay. You can pull it off. Clean copy will be posted to the website. And where is this video going? May I ask so I can tell people how do they watch it? YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube, and I think Larry's going to give us an address that you will be able to get off the website and click and go. Okay. Right. On Sebastopol Bay Channel. Yes, it'll be on our channel 986 for charter subscribers. And Amy will uh, have a link on one of the pages uh, on the uh, town website to the video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. In, in thank a few you. days. In a few days, did you say? Well, as soon as I can hit it up. So, there. like next next week's so probably tomorrow. Okay, thank but you. But three days would be safer. Yep, thank you. Okay. New business to be placed on a future agenda item. Um, I don't think we have a vice chair for this commission, so maybe we should talk about having a vice chair. That would be one item. And um, bring back, again, the short-term rental ordinance with our attorney comments. I don't know what the turnaround time might be. Thank you for coming, both of you that are leaving. Thank you for coming. Um, I don't know what the turnaround time will be for our attorney. Any guesses? Well, she's, she's working on an, uh, an ordinance for broadband and a few other things. So yeah. uh, I'd say three or four weeks. I'm not going <clears> to. <throat> I'll ask her, but I have a feeling that we're not our only customer. So we might, we probably shouldn't um, have a meeting for a month. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask her when, what her term, turnaround time might be, and I get back to you with that. And see, but I'm guessing three to four weeks, something like that. 
Okay, next meeting date then? Is this still a good time for you, Derek? You prefer the evening? Yes. <coughs> Any suggestions on our next meeting date? If last, our attorney turnaround time is three to four last, weeks. Last week in uh, October. 29th. Well, okay, let's shoot for uh, let's shoot for Thursday, October 29th at 7 p.m. And if we don't have a response from our attorney, then We'll let everybody know and postpone it a week or two. Okay? How's that? Good. Okay. All right. So, next meeting, Thursday, October 29th, 7 p.m. We haven't adjourned yet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Terry. I'll second that. Second, Mary Ellen. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all, everyone. <laughs>